Mr. Clerk, the time is 7 p.m. I call this public planning meeting to order. Procedural notes. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, meetings will be available to the public via live stream only on the town's YouTube channel. To participate electronically, please visit aurora.ca slash participation. Council, can you get a motion to approve the agenda? Councilor Gilliland, second Councilor Gallo. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, Ms. Clerk. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we are electronic voting from with you, Scott. Okay, so, so uh, we will uh, call the vote and uh, should pop up on your iPads or other devices. So used to the uh, Zoom meetings and asking you to call, uh, to call the vote. So we'll call the vote. <laughs> Councillor Humphreys, we need you to do verbal because you don't have your iPad with you. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Gardner? I'll be right back. Okay. Councillor Gardner is absent. First. That carries. Any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Well, welcome to Aurora's public planning meeting. The purpose of this public meeting is to inform the public and obtain public input regarding the proposed official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of subdivision. For the planning application that will be considered by council tonight, the following process will occur. One, town planning staff will outline the purpose of the planning application being considered. Two, then the applicant will be given an opportunity to make a presentation and address issues raised in the staff report or public concerns already filed. Three, following these presentations, members of the public will be invited to offer their comments or concerns respecting the item virtually. And four, either town staff or the applicant will answer your questions. I'll keep track of the questions, and when I have several, I will direct them to whoever can best answer them. It is very important the town receive the correct names and addresses of the individuals having an interest in the planning applications. Therefore, if you plan to speak to council at this meeting, or if you wish to be notified of any further council or committee meetings concerning the applications being considered, you must complete a planning interested party and speaker request form, which is available on the town's website at aurora.ca slash planning notices, or contact planning and development services by email at planning at aurora.ca. Under the Planning Act, the applicant or residents have the right to appeal any decision of council on a planning application to the local planning appeal tribunal. But you must verbally express any comments or concerns here tonight or submit any comments or concerns in writing to the town prior to council adopting an amendment. The tribunal may dismiss all or part of an appeal in respect of an application. This public meeting is being audio and video recorded. Names, addresses, comments, and any other personal information are being recorded according to the Municipal Act and the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. This will help our town clerk prepare accurate minutes and to create a record that is available to the general public, including the town's website. Questions about this collection should be directed to the town clerk, Town of Aurora. I will now ask the town clerk to confirm that notification to the public occurred as required by the Planning Act. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Respecting item 4.1, PDS 21-099, official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and draft plan of subdivision, Shining Hill Collections, Inc., 162, 306, 370, 434, and 488 St. John Side Road West. File number OPA-2021-02, ZBA-2021-02, and SUB-2021-01. On April 1st, 2021, a notice of complete application was published in the Aurora and the Aurora Banner newspapers, and a sign giving notice of a complete application was posted on the subject lands. On August 19th, 2021, notices were mailed to all address property owners within a minimum of 120 meters of the subject lands and to all interested parties. Signage on the subject lands was updated with today's public meeting information. 
On August 26, 2021, a notice of public planning meeting was published in the Aurora and Aurora Banner newspapers. Public notification has been provided, provided in accordance with the Planning Act. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I will now ask the Director of Planning and Development Services to begin with the presentations. Mr. Waters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll start off with the applicant's presentation to be followed by the uh, staff presentation by the town planner who has a uh, responsibility of the file. Mr. Waters. I know we have about nine people from representing the applicant. Um, Mr. Given, will you be speaking or will any will someone else be starting? I will be speaking, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I do have others with me that are will be available for questions, uh, which I would imagine we all put over until we hear from the residents, but they include uh, our natural heritage uh, experts, uh, uh, engineers to deal with stormwater, and uh, any other questions you might have, we'll try to field them myself. Starting first with the um, proposal, uh, the lands are familiar to most of the people that have been following this application. It's approximately 32 hectares of land located north of what the council have already approved, which is phase two of the Shining Hill collection. And it contains an extensive amount of uh, forest and, and a water course, uh, all of which I will show you later will be retained. What you see to the right of the site is what is known as the Dunnan House, which is proposed to be the St. Anne's uh, College uh, for Girls school, school. And the other areas that you see are no longer uh, covered with buildings or trails, so those have been removed, but they represented the stables and hockey rink that were on the property at the time my client purchased the land. The red line that you see running north-south through the property is the limit of the Oak Ridges Moraine. Next slide, please. So the phase two, as I mentioned before, is already approved. The total holdings we're showing you extend up into New Market, connect out to Bathurst Street. Uh, again, you can see the limits of the Oak Ridges Moraine, which is to the west of the red line. Phase one in New Market is already under construction. In the future, we would expect to be doing some uh, further uh, applications along Young Street, both in New Market and in Aurora. But for now, we are looking only at the area outlined in the light blue. Next slide, please. This is the plan of subdivision. Uh, what you see in the plan of subdivision by color indicates the type of use. The uh, green that you see to the west is that natural heritage system that will be protected and, and enhanced. The blue is the future home of St. Anne's. The green to the right of the uh, blue just touching on the Oak Ridges Moraine will be a park. The yellow are low density houses, single family. And you can see, and this is the original plan that we submitted, we were proposing in that brownish color apartment buildings. Next slide, please. What has changed is that the uh, green remains the same, although it's been enhanced somewhat uh, with some smoothing out of the lots behind the different uh, parts of the subdivision adjacent to that natural heritage feature. The school remains the same. What you see in, uh, in addition to the school block is another blue block, which has reduced the yield on the single family to allow for a driveway entrance into St. Anne's coming off street B so that the school will have a, an Aurora address. We also have changed the apartment block to add some townhouses in and a stormwater pond. We did remove the stormwater pond from the west side, moved it to the east. And we'd like to think of that as a pond that could be done in a cell underground with a trailhead over top to allow people to park their cars so they can have access to the valley trails. Next slide, please. These, these are what I've just highlighted to you. One that I didn't miss is we've added more open space on the east side of the north-south roadway just to enhance that vista as you're driving north on the roadway. Next slide, please. So the overall difference as a result of these changes, and they do come as a result of listening to the residents, is that in removing the apartments, we have removed uh, 200 units from the plan. 
and replace that with townhouses, which are 21 townhouses and a couple of singles. So the total change in this development is significant. We have reduced the yield by 180 units. You also see below the table, all the different components of this. Uh, it, stand, it stands out that 55% of the area is gonna be natural heritage. The residential area will be about 5.7 hectares or 18%. The school, 13.5%. Roads represent about 7%. Uh, the neighborhood park, 5%, five, 5%, and the trailhead about 0.1%. So this is going to be a very green community, uh, really anchored by St. Anne's, which is the feature uh, that is most important for uh, both my client who wants to accommodate St. Anne's and for, and for St. Andrew's College to move forward with their girls' school. Next slide, please. Just to put it in context, what you see in the Aurora official plan today is OPA 37 and highlighted in that in the northwest corner of this colored drawing, you'll see OPA 37 points to pointing to where phase two is. Phase three, if we go to the next slide, is an enlargement of that area with the extent of phase three being shown in a red line. The area that you see in brown is the natural heritage system. Uh, you can then see to the right corner or in the middle there, uh, a, sort of a checkerboard pattern with a road pattern in it. That was proposed in OPA 37 for housing. Much of that, however, is wooded and uh, we would be protecting that for, for the longer term for natural heritage uh, feature to be incorporated into the plan. And you can see to the right, the blue, uh, that's a, it's got a very area specific type of uh, permission which would allow up to 350 apartments, 90 medical units. And if I could just get you to scroll up for me, Madam Clerk, so I can show you the balance of it. Oops, we've missed, we've jumped right over it. It's uh, not reading with all these um, pictures of us on the, but basically what the blue area would allow is 350 apartment use, 90 medical care units, and a conference center for the over for 60 people. Um, that's a significant change from what we are proposing. That's, um, that use has been in place for some time. We are proposing residential units, uh, and uh, there's uh, quite a difference between what is permitted in the official plan today and what we are proposing. We are significantly under the you know, permissions granted by this official plan in either OPA 37 or in the blue area. Next slide, please. We are also adding some additional vegetation that needs to be protected in green areas, which you see in the bright colored green. Uh, that's what I referred to you before, where I said there would be limited amount of housing. We're not taking advantage of that designation. So that's different than OPA 37 had anticipated. And we're also adding some green to the north side of the phase two plan. Uh, we did not put that into the phase two plan at the time we made the application because we weren't sure what the uh, limits would be for a natural heritage system, but we are comfortable with our knowledge now and we're prepared to put all of that into public ownership. Next slide, please. We did listen to the comments from the public um, the one that stood out the most was the concern about the mid-rise condo. We have removed that, as I said, and replaced it with townhouses and a trailhead and a swim pond. There was concern about the hill on the mid-rise block. We've investigated that further. That was not a natural condition. That was a feature made by the previous owner as he removed topsoil and graded the property and mounted it in this area. With respect to tree removal, we have uh, a tree removal uh, program that has uh, been submitted to the municipality in accordance with all of the different requirements for tree protection and preservation. And um, over 2,000 2, trees were recorded and assessed of which about approximately 1,320 trees are proposed to be removed. 171 trees require removal because of poor health and 2,333 2, trees will be replanted as compensation. Next slide, please. 
This is the uh, look of the plan with uh, some of the compensation areas already shown to you. Uh, starting first with the buff color that you see there, that is the extent of the residential. You can see the park that is in the north part of the block. That park uh, organization is something that has been created by city or town staff. Uh, the municipality and the and St. Anne's both have an interest in using this property. Uh, it will be owned by the municipality and the municipal staff did provide guidance on how to organize this space. This is not a final approval, but it picks up on what ideas were provided to us by the town staff. You can see St. Anne's with the bleachers and the parking behind the playing field, which would allow for access to by vehicles to park near to the playing field so that spectators can go to the bleachers. There's tennis courts proposed in the area. Uh, some play areas as well. And St. Anne's, you can see, is expanding uh, on the house in the longer term. To the east, you'll see an area that is shown as potential tree compensation. That would be along the edge of the valley. And in addition, as part of the compensation that I've mentioned to you, the area that had been previously removed, or vegetation was removed to create a ski hill, will be, re as we're proposing that it would be planted up so it becomes more of a natural valley condition. You can also see to the east further, the, the trail system. Uh, we're proposing that the trail system connect up into New Market, uh, connect down into the municipality crossing at Young Street, um, crossing in the north uh, as well on Young Street. But what we would like to point out is since um, our client has acquired land where you see that red uh, flower symbol is that, that that be considered as another trailhead that allows people to come in on the existing driveway, which have to be upgraded to the area that would get them to park adjacent to the trail. Because at this time, you cannot get into the valley from either Young Street or from St. John's. This would facilitate that access for residents and others in the future. Mr. Chairman, next, uh, or Madam Clerk, or who, next slide, please. This is St. Anne's uh, College building. It is the former Dunn and Estates. Uh, in 2022-2023, they expect to have an enrollment of 40 students plus staff with an ultimate capacity of 600 students plus staff. This is a magnificent structure. It certainly needed to be preserved. It's a wonderful asset for the municipality and for St. Andrews and St. Anne's. And we're glad that it's, it's finding a proper home. Next, please. So impacts on wildlife, we have looked at this and I will ask Mr. Henshaw if he would like to speak on this particular aspect because it did come up in the residents' comments uh, about the concerns they have about what's happening with the wildlife. Mr. Henshaw. Hello. Hi. I hear you. You can hear me. You can't see me. Is that okay? It's perfectly fine. We can all hear you. Okay. You can. I think you're controlling my video, but that's okay. Um. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to get this technology sorted out. So, as the slide uh, explains, um, we have. Oh. Start my video, there we are. How's that? Is that working? Yes. Good. Uh, so as, as the slide explains, um, we've done uh, a lot of natural heritage field investigations and um, I, I won't go through all of them, but there's been amphibian surveys, floral surveys, surveys for threatened and endangered species, surveys uh, which includes birds and butternut trees um there's been ecological land classification uh there's a whole range of study uh, study components that go into what's called an nhe and for those of you who are familiar with this an nhe is a natural heritage evaluation which is the same thing as an environmental impact study but it's called something different on the oak ridges moraine um the NHE, uh, as the second bullet explains, it dealt with the Endangered Species Act partially. And the reason I say partially is because Endangered Species Act information has to be current. 
And there were things that, um, uh, in particular, the removal of trees, we've got to be very careful because of bat habitat. And so there's been additional work done on bats and we've in installed uh, in the summertime uh, special acoustic detectors. And we've done what's called snag surveys, which is to identify and map where the potential bat habitat trees are. And then subsequent to uh, the NHE, there will be conversations with um, the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, MECP, um, to make sure that whatever happens here before a single tree is removed is in conformity with the Endangered Species Act. So that's a slightly different from the NHE because that has to be dealt with in real time. So if this application took, say, several years before anything happened, uh, th that piece would still have to be current. So having done all that work and identified uh, the existing conditions, uh, we then looked at what would the potential impacts be uh, from a development adjacent to these lands. And that leads us into the realm of what can we do to mitigate those potential impacts. And the NHE provides a summary of the kinds of things that can be done, such as buffers, uh, in addition to the design of the subdivision, which is to protect the natural features that we've identified in accordance with the um, Oak Ridge's Marine Conservation Plan. Then uh, we established the fact that the NHS is going to be conveyed uh, uh, into public ownership and we apply those mitigations. And our job then is to look at what the net impact might be and to make sure that the net impact, as far as we can reasonably um, ascertain, I mean, there's, you know, this is science, it's never black and white, there's always those gray areas, but as far as we can uh, ascertain, is going to result in no negative impact on the features that we've identified as important. And it is, I, I do use the word important because um, no matter where you go, in a farm field, uh, in a piece of, you know, uh, residential property, there's always wildlife, there's wildlife everywhere. And our test is to identify the wildlife that is important according to the policies and, uh, of the day and also the regulations when it comes to the conservation authority. Um, I'll, I'm gonna address uh, the buffers a little bit because I know there's a lot of interest in buffers and there's a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a, one of those challenging areas to understand because we often hear about 120 meters and 120 meters is often referred to as a buffer when as actual fact, it's a trigger for a study. And in the study, uh, outside of the settlement area on the Oak Ridge's Moraine, the buffers are defined as a minimum 30 meters. But inside the settlement area, which this is, uh, the buffers are to be determined through a study. And I'm not gonna bore you with the numbers of the policies, but they are on the slide there. Uh, that is uh, the policy that says in a settlement area, you can do, you can either take the 30 meters and run with it, or you can do a detailed study to determine what the appropriate buffer should be, which is what happened here. And when we look at a buffer, we look at, we look at three things really. Um, first of all, we've got to understand what we're dealing with. And I've, that's the existing conditions. The second thing is once we've established that existing condition, we really uh, need to understand how sensitive is it to uh, a development going next to it. And so I'll give you an example. Um, there's a thing called an area of natural and scientific interest, and there's a geological area of natural and scientific interest, and it could be a big rock. And so if you were putting a buffer around a big rock, uh, you wouldn't need a very big buffer because uh, the rock itself is not very sensitive to disturbance. Now it's not the same with wildlife, obviously. Uh, but I'm just using that as an extreme example. So with wildlife, we look to see, is this wildlife or um, feature, let's say if it's a wetland, is it a very sensitive one or is it less sensitive uh, to the stresses that might come from adjacent development? And then the third leg that we look at is, what is that adjacent development? Because sometimes it might be a stormwater management facility or a park or a school, and that might be very different to the kinds of effects that we might see, say, um, from 
uh, residential um, houses backing onto a feature. And it's not always what you might think. In some cases, the residential housing back onto a feature might be better than having a park block or it might be worse. It, it really depends. Um, and so we go through that process and we also use something else. And that is what is the standard precedence? Uh, I know I said there was three and I've added this one because this one's not quite as important as the other, as the other three things that we look at. Uh, but we do also consider uh, what is the conservation authority requiring? What does the official plan uh, say about these things? So there is that sort of precedence and policy that might influence what the buffer width should be. And in this case, um, we've applied 10 meters to the drip line of the woodlands, which is sometimes a few meters away from the tree itself, um, and 30 meters to uh, the wetlands on the subject property. Next slide, please. I don't think that's ecology. And I, I know we're gonna circle back, Don, um, um, uh, later on for questions. So I'll pass it back to you now. Thank you, Brian. Uh, traffic was an issue that was raised by several people. Uh, they were concerned about the um, uh, difficulty, uh, as I recall from phase two, crossing to the north side of St. John's. Uh, and my understanding is that uh, I, in the phase two area where we have the entrances, there will be a request from the town to the region to allow for a pedestrian activated signal to allow those on the south to get across to the north side where they will connect into the sidewalk that my client has committed to building from the western side of phase two to the extent possible out to Young Street. I really say that to the extent possible because the bridge structure that is in place today uh, close to Young Street where it crosses this, the river um, is not very wide and it may be some time before we can complete that access connection. But I do want to show you if I could go to the next slide and just and then I will come back again. The, this is a, uh, a plan from the region of York's um, official plan and where you see the green these are the rights of way that are anticipated in the future uh, and this plan was prepared for a time period of up to 2031. What we've highlighted is that the green is a 36 meter right of way along St. John's all the way out to Bathurst Street. That is what we are working towards. And that right of way requirement is what the region has asked for as a part of the plan of subdivision that we provide for that. Now, if we could go back to the slide, is in order to deal with that, um, we thought to understand how we can implement that. And the implementation of that means that we have to anticipate a four lane roadway with traffic uh, moving in uh, both directions on two lanes each way. And then above the curb, a pedestrian type of system that would allow for connection all the way across, which I've already previously mentioned. And, in, and when that happened and we had to implement that, the vegetation along the north side became part of the right of way that had to be altered. My client um, has uh, it will have to do that further to the east along the north side in order to implement this requirement. And as a part of that is proposing to plant adjacent to the walkway, new trees that would allow for rest restoration of a vegetation edge along the north side of St. John's. We have also looked into the traffic generated by St. Anne's. As I told you, it's 40 students initially going to 200. And, and considering that we have dropped uh, several hundred, uh, you know, hundred units in this plan, I think that that more than offsets any traffic concerns that might come from St. John's or from St. Anne's, I'm sorry. Next slide, please. Uh, road connections to Bathurst Street were asked for to run through the wooded area. Uh, that's not going to happen. That's through uh, areas that are highly, um, will be highly protected uh, from an environmental point of view. And I just don't see any way of connecting east to west, uh, north of St. John's, except as we have done up through New Market and out to Bathurst Street. There's a concern about the lack of amenity areas within walking distance. We are proposing a very extensive trail system to connect both to the south and to the north, a neighborhood park within, which is within the block. So that acts as an amenity area and community-wide parkland amenities are contemplated throughout this. And I mentioned those 
uh, earlier when I showed you the trailhead and the trail system and the potential for the valley to be used for active recreation use. One of the issues that has come up is the barn swallow nest removal. At the time of demolition of the uh, small building and the paddock uh, by a contractor, it wasn't clear whether the barn swallow was still on the nest. We, we have no evidence of that. Um, the our applicant, my client, has offered to construct a new barn swallow structure in the valley lands as compensation for that. With respect to the wetland marsh feature by the existing entry road, that is not a man-made feature. That is a man-made feature that was created by the previous owner as he was grading to accommodate his driveway. Uh, there's no reason why we should have to compensate for the removal of that. Next slide, please. This is the overall look of the development when you see the full picture. You can see the subdivision with the townhouses in orange, uh, the swim pond, the park, St. Anne's, and to the north you can see what it would be planned for in New Market. Uh, we have an official plan amendment application in New Market that is being processed and uh, we expect to see some movement on that before the end of the year. But that gives you the overall picture so that you can understand the extent to which we are planning on this comprehensively. Uh, we expect there will be a need for an elementary school in New Market. Uh, we are proposing to have within that area where you see the park and the mid-rise, some retail potentially, with retail potentially out of Bathurst Street as well. Um, so we're, we're contemplating adding um, more, more than just residential to this area. Uh, we've been asked by New Market to plan for this comprehensively using the highest standards possible for new community uh, development. Next slide, please. So servicing allocation has been questioned. We've been advised by the town there is capacity available. Source water protection has been a question raised by others. Our York Region have confirmed that a Section 59 notice is not required. That would be something that you would have to do if there was an issue with source water under the Clean Water Act. Slope stability report, uh, that's going to be reviewed. We have done the report, it's being reviewed and there may be some feedback on it that could impact the edges of the draft plan, but we're expecting that what we have is pretty close to the, to the final. Uh, if we have to, we would modify the plan to deal with that. But at this point in time, that document is still under review. With respect to the underground stormwater management facility, this is becoming more common and desirable as it's a very efficient use of the land. It provides usable space on the surface that can be used for public use, uh, such as the parking lot that we talked about or some, uh, some play space. Uh, we also find that it, it deals with uh, some of the things that public is concerned about. Uh, some of them are safety issues. Um, some of them are garbage issues that uh, accumulate that have to be removed. Uh, the pests uh, like mosquitoes uh, breeding in the pond are a nuisance. Uh, there's no open water with these uh, type of uh, things. And it creates a better um, a maintenance system too, with a lifespan that exceeds these, storm, these open ponds uh, and uses less land because they have vertical walls that are, are used to uh, contain this in a concrete chamber or, or, or other form of uh, structure that um, means that you no longer have to have those side slopes uh, with where you see all the uh, vegetation that becomes unruly and difficult to maintain. Next slide, please. This is a, a couple of examples of where stormwater ponds are being dealt with underground. Uh, Thornhill Village in the green, you can see that there's a large area there highlighted which contains a storm function. And you can see what it looks like being constructed in this case. Basically, it's a big chamber uh, that contains the water, uh, maintains it at uh, cooler temperatures than if it's surfaced, so that when it's discharged, it has less impact on the temperatures of the receiving streams that it's uh, discharging to. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present this again. I'm hoping that uh, uh, through this meeting, we'll advance the proposal um, in everybody's minds that we have been responsive to the concerns that have been raised and uh, we'll entertain questions after, I would assume, after the staff make their presentation. Thank you, Mr. Givens. Mr. Waters? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Rosanna Puneet, the uh, planner from the town, will now make a short presentation on the uh, application. Thank you.
Good evening, Mayor, Councillors, and members of the public. We are here this evening to, to discuss the second non-statutory public meeting tonight for the noted applications. Um, I see the applicant has gone through a lot of the stuff, so my presentation will be a little quicker. The proposed development and associated amendment are proposed for the north side of St. John side road, west of Young Street, east of Bathurst. The subject lands comprise of five parcels of property, municipally known as 162, 306, 370, 434 and 488 St. John side road. The subject lands are vacant with the exception of 306 and 162 St. John side road. The, there's a dwelling on the site that is known as the Dunnan property and is the subject of the future St. Anne's school. The subject lands are irregular in shape and have an approximate area of 31.79 hectares, which is equivalent to 2.47 acres. There is a significant natural heritage system located on the majority of the property. The subject lands are within the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority regulated area. The surrounding land uses are as follows. To the north, we have undeveloped lands, natural heritage lands, and the town of Newmarket. To the south, we have St. John Side Road, phase two of Shining Hill Estate Collections, Inc. And to to the, to the east, we have some vacant land, natural heritage lands, and Young Street further east. To the west, we have natural heritage lands and a residential subdivision. A portion of these lands are identified as site-specific policy area number 14, as mentioned by the applicant. These lands permit a comprehensive retirement complex, including 350 apartments, 90 medical care units, medical clinics, related administrative offices, and a conference center. The conference center is to provide overnight accommodation for a maximum of 60 persons and includes space for daytime conferences. The site-specific policy further states the, the retirement complex and conference center are to be connected to the town sanitary system and municipal water supply. No development will be permitted until council has approved a master site plan agreement. The existing official plan, uh, which is also included in OP, official plan amendment number 37, the remainder of these lands are designated suburban residential, suburban residential one, and core open space area, in addition to supporting area open space. Last year, the town of Aurora General Committee draft approved a plan of subdivision for the south portion of the lands, which is being referred to as phase two. This development has 90 single detached units. These lands are also, again, owned by Shining Hill Estates Collection. At this time, the owner is working on clearing the draft plan conditions imposed for the subdivision. In addition, the applicant has submitted a site plan application for these lands, and these will be presented at a future council meeting. The existing zoning on the site include Oak Ridge's Moraine Rural General, Rural, as well as Institutional. Within the Oak Ridge's Moraine General Zone, the zoning bylaw provisions state that no person shall use these lands, including expanding, enlarging, or otherwise altering an existing site, building, or structure for any use other than a use legally existed on the lands as of November 15, 2001. Also, uh, a building permit that has already been legally issued is allowed there at this time. No amendment to the zoning bylaw will be needed. Uh, uses permitted on the rural zone include agricultural uses, detached dwelling, second suites, greenhouses, home occupation, and places of worship. Uses permitted in the institutional zone include athletic fields, cemetery, daycare centers, hospitals, public library, long-term care facility, museum, a place of worship, a recreation center, retirement home, post-secondary school, private school, and public school. As seen, the draft concept plan 
uh, contemplates 87 single detached dwellings, 21 townhouse units, a neighborhood park, a, a school block, a natural heritage system, a stormwater uh, management area, trailhead block, and public and private roads. Um, again, this is the same development concept shown in the applicant's presentation. I'd like to note the mid-high rise block as indicated in the last meeting has now been removed and now townhouses are contemplated in the site. Um, one thing to note is the town of Newmarket to the north, there's a future road connection. The town would have to look into this and ensure that appropriate, appropriate dedications um, road widths and all that is contemplated. With that being said, the town of Aurora side can proceed without the town of Newmarket at this time. The proposed official plan for the site. The image displays redesignation proposed. The current SR1 designation within OPA 37 allows for neighborhood oriented support services such as schools and parks to be permitted. The applicant is not seeking a change in this designation on the portion of the land where the St. Anne School site is. However, there is a small portion of land that is proposed to be redesignated from supporting open space to supporting residential, sorry, suburban residential. This area is within the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority area and will require further review. The official plan amendment proposes an increase in height for the single detached dwellings from 10 meters to 11 meters or three stories, whichever is less. York Region has indicated that they will approve that they will be the approval authority for the proposed official plan amendments. The applicant is also proposing to rezone the subject lands as indicated in the image above. The zoning bylaw amendment contemplates site-specific exceptions to single detached dwellings and townhouse dwellings proposed. The proposed application will be reviewed in context of the provincial, regional, and municipal policy documents as listed in the slide. Some matters that need to be addressed. One of them being finalizing the official plan amendment, zoning bylaw and draft plan of subdivision documents and compatibility with the provincial plans. In addition, further analysis is required for the potential future road connection between Aurora and Newmarket. Vegetation management initiatives to preserve additional trees is also going to be reviewed. The Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority have addressed that the applications must align with section 3.1 of the provincial policy statement. The subject site is located with an area that is subject to policies contained within the source protection, source water protection plan. A portion of these lands subject to the proposed official plan amendment are lo located within a currently identified area, are currently identified as rural, uh, rural area indicated that bringing these Give me a second. <laughs> a portion of these lands are proposed with, within the OPA are within an area identified as rural area. These lands must be brought up into conformity with the Regional Municipal Comprehensive Review. As addressed by the applicant, I won't go through all of them if they've been uh, addressed by the applicant in their in presentation, but the public comments from the June 8th public meeting, as well as comments that have come in to date include uh, mid high rise block being an issue, traffic, um, as in addition to the sidewalks located on St. John's Side Road, the tree removals, wildlife existing on the site, heritage buffers, natural heritage buffers, amenity areas, and the barn swallow nest removal. Um, in addition to that, the stormwater cell was also a question that came up. Um, so in addition to that, these were some of the items addressed by the applicant in their presentation. But one thing I want to note is that the comments provided at the public meeting, as well as any comments provided after this public meeting throughout the course of the process 
will be provided by Planning and Development Services in a re future report to Council to a general committee meeting. The next steps at this point in time, oh, sorry, the next steps, staff will take all the comments tonight and make sure they're presented at a future general committee meeting. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, yes, we'll move. We have six speakers from the public on my list. Is that correct? Thank you. Oh, sorry, we have five. Yes, we have five. First up is uh, Wendy Kenyon. Ms. Kenyon? Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes, if I, hi, Wendy, if, you, if I could just get you to state your name and your address and you have five oh, minutes. Sure. Um, yes, um, good evening, Mayor Maracas, councillors, everyone. I'm Wendy Kenyon, uh, resident of Aurora and VP of HFARA. Um, I have already given my address to, uh, to the town. May I begin? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, I'm eager to speak tonight about the removal of the active threatened species barn swallow nest. Uh, given the speculation at the last meeting, uh, I think it's important that the public hears the facts. However, before I do that, as we've only just recently seen the applicants' responses about buffer size, I'd like to address this first and talk about the barn swallow during the next round, if I may. So buffers. Um, at the last meeting, I asked why the buffers are so thin. The applicant has now provided the following comments. Uh, comment one, the typical woodland buffer in settlement areas is 10 meters. So my response to that, in my opinion, environmental firms working on behalf of developers appear to be actively promoting this reduction. The schedule of buffers, i.e. minimum vegetation protection zones in the uh, Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan, the OMCP, is a good measure of what is acceptable, as this was compiled methodically by a group of individuals whose prime intent was to pr protect the moraine, not to, not to facilitate its development. Even in settlement areas, the recommended buffer for significant woodland is 30 meters, not 10, even though sadly, the environmental reports produced by firms representing developers can recommend less. I can't help but feel there's a conflict of interest there. Comment two, they consider how sensitive is the feature and the stressor and policy documents to provide guidance. My response, the natural heritage systems to the west and the east have been identified as extremely sensitive i.e. confirmed significant wildlife habitat and potential endangered bat habitat. The NHE has also identified area sensitive bird species in the valley. The stressor is months, most likely years, of subdivision construction and human disturbance thereafter, including trails, dogs off leash and dumping. As for policy guidance, the Provincial Policy Statement, Section 2.1.8, which represents minimum standards, says that development and site alteration shall not be permitted on adjacent lands, i.e. 120 metres. And yes, Mr. Henshaw, I do know it's the trigger, but it's unless it's demonstrated, there will be no negative impact on the natural features or their ecological functions. I don't believe that's been proven here. Comment three, there's nothing unusual about the buffer widths. I find this comment particularly concerning because what it's really saying is that we've come so far from the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan standards that thin is now the new norm. Environmental firms appear to be recommending thinner buffers and conservation authorities with their limited resources can only spend so much time pushing back. For example, regarding the seepage area on the St. Anne's property, the applicant's representative listed the seep as a waterfowl and turtle nesting area, an amphibian and marsh bird breeding area. 
According to the environmental report, the applicant proposed a five to 10 meter buffer, which is less than the, than the Orm CP buffer of 30 meters or more. The Conservation Authority instructed the applicant to revise the site plan to provide a minimum 15 meter buffer. However, the applicant's response was that they would increase the buffer to an average of 15 meters with no less than five meters. So this didn't actually comply with the Conservation Authority's, authority's instructions. Minimum isn't the same as maximum, I, I beg your pardon, minimum isn't the same as average and shouldn't have allowed the buffer to be reduced to just five meters. After all, the seep is of ecological value, yet the applicant's consultant managed to secure buffer reduced to five meters in parts against the Conservation Authority's clear instructions. Finally, I'd like to end with an extract from the Breeding Birds of Aurora 2017 report produced by David Tomlinson and Nature Aurora. It reads, we have to decide as a society if we really intend to protect wildlife included in priority lists or that these lists are just political rhetoric designed to lull the public into believing that wildlife is being adequately and scientifically protected from the effects of development. The results of this survey and other surveys we've undertaken on the effect of development on our existing breeding bird populations in Aurora prove that the currently accepted 10 to 35 meter buffer zone protection needs to be reviewed. It is totally inadequate to protect the populations of our once common, but now often declining wetland, woodland, shrub and grassland breeding bird species. I, I think that says that all. Okay, I think you. we need to listen to the wise words of those who genuinely care about the wildlife of this town. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Next up, I have Marcella Sidi. Marcella, I know I got your last name wrong, so I apologize. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Marcel, if I could just get you to say your name, state your name, yep. and your address, and you have five minutes. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor Maracas, counselors, everyone. I'm Marcella Sacida, and I live in Aurora. Um, I want to circle back um, to June 8th. At the public meeting on June 8th, I asked how the extensive tree removal on the Shining Hill property aligns with the town's issuing of a climate emergency. This then prompted a discussion about the size of the trees, when they were planted, whether they've been native and how many are being saved. To me, this felt more like an exercise in trying to justify uh, the unthinkable and rather an honest acknowledgement of what already is lost, um, what's being proposed by this developer. I ask again, do we have a climate emergency or not? Um, if you've been watching the news recently, you've all seen and heard about the devastating floods landslides and wildfires in Europe, the forest fires out west, including my home state of California, flooding in New York and New Jersey, even flash floods here in Aurora. We've been lucky so far, but uh, bottom line, no one wants a flooded basement. I can attest to this with uh, some recent flooding. Um, to spend summer days inside due to poor air quality, to experience higher food prices due to failed crops. Um, we can say, you can say, Adverse weather events have always occurred, but uh, the indisputable fact is that this is becoming more frequent and more severe. Therefore, to answer my own question, yes, we do have a climate emergency. Um, so first I'd like to correct some information, um, actually some misinformation given by the planning director uh, during the June 8th public planning meeting. He said that Beacon's environmental study confirms that the majority of trees for proposed removal are less than five centimeters in diameter. This statement is incorrect. Beacon's Arborist report on March 2021 20, states that the tree inventory did not include 
trees below five centimeters, with the exception of six. Um, so the truth is that contrary to what the director told council and the public, 99.9% .9 of the approximate 1,500 trees to be removed are at the very least five centimeters, not less. And we know that hundreds are well above that, um, with the majority in the higher width category and many above, including a maple tree in good condition, which is uh, tree number 213 on the tree inventory table with a uh, DBH of 120 centimeters. Uh, secondly, at uh, the June 8th public meeting, when asked about the 1500 trees, Mr. Given said, most of those are not native plant. However, Beacon's Arborist report actually shows that a large number of trees for proposed removal are in fact native to Ontario. Page six of the Arborist report says that of the 914 tallied trees, those proposed for removal are composed of elm and white ash. Um, primary, I'm sorry, uh, Scots pine, white spruce, American elm, and white ash. White spruce, American elm, and white ash are all native to Ontario. Um, a further 374 private trees, most com uh, comprised of white spruce, Scots pines, white pine, and Norway spruce. Uh, white spruce and white pine are native. Other native trees proposed removal include sugar, Manitoba, and silver maples, trembling aspen, black walnut, uh, green ash, red oak, basswood, bur oak, eastern white, cedar, black cherry, American beech, red cedar, white birch. These are all native trees of Ontario. Uh, thirdly, we understand that approximately 588 trees are currently earmarked for preservation. Um, and that's realistic, that's an optimistic figure um, given all the unknowns. But do we really think this is, deserves a pat on the back? Why are we setting the bar so low on these environmentally sensitive lands? Using as our baseline, no trees saved whatsoever with anything above that a so-called achievement. That's not how it works in a climate emergency. So let's not kid ourselves. The critical measurement is what will be lost right now. In this case, a minimum of 1500 trees, if not more. Uh, in terms of the age of the trees, regardless how old they are, fast growing trees also provide an essential service because they capture carbon more quickly from the atmosphere. The likely minimum 1500 trees proposed removal are currently holding carbon in their tissues. Um, as are the hedge grows that will also be removed as is the soil that will be severely disturbed. These important climate facts are relevant yet seemingly ignored. Um, the city of Toronto's research study aptly named Every Tree Counts recognizes that large, healthy, long lived trees provide the greatest value of all. The study concludes the most effective strategy is to preserve and manage the trees you already have. In the city of Toronto, if the city of Toronto can recognize this basic concept, so should the town of Aurora. In conclusion, if council is to walk the talk, then it's time to stand behind this powerful proclamation of climate emergency and take action based on the stark reality. We all know there's plenty of open space on that land for houses to be built without the need for the loss of well over 1500 trees. Trees that are actually helping to address this very real climate emergency. Councillors simply put, we need our trees and too many have already been lost during phase two. Remember, this is on your watch and we ask that you use this time to make a lasting positive difference. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. Next we have George Skoulakis. Yes, good evening. George, if I could just get you to state your name and your address, you have five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Good evening, Mayor Maracas, Councillors and everyone. My name is George Skalikas. I am a resident of Aurora and the president of HFARA. Overall, this Shining Hill Phase 3 application lacks sufficient information, accuracy and quality of information. The application has now changed yet again with the removal of the high rise to townhouses and the separation of St. Anne's School now to be dealt with as phase four. While I'm grateful that the high density block has been removed for townhouses, I have never been more concerned as I am now with this application and how this application is being handled by the planning department. 
I don't expect counselors to read all the reports, but I expect staff to guide them through these applications with well-researched and correct information. It is my opinion that this is not happening. In fact, quite the opposite. Staff and consultants have making, are, are making questionable statements to cancel and to the public. The implication of, the, of this is serious and very concerning. Firstly, I'm concerned by the lack of information and unanswered questions. Lack of information and slow stability, water source protection, road service and road connections, lot configuration, wildlife inventory and impacts, snag survey, uh, wetland offsetting, and St. Anne's School. There are so many unanswered questions from LSRCA, the region, Aurora Engineering, and Planning Department, and the public, such that the L LSRCA requested the applications to be deferred, and York Region refers to the application as premature. Secondly, I am concerned by the questionable comments that have been made by the town's planning director and the applicant's consultant in support of this application. Questionable comments on tree size and tree types, wildlife and wildlife habitat, barn swallow nest, traffic study data, and encroachment areas. I am concerned that none of these questionable comments have been properly challenged except by the public by Councillor Gallo and by Councillor Gardner. It should not be up to the public to verify questionable comments made by the consultant and by Aurora's planning staff. I alerted this council yesterday in writing with specific examples so that you can substantiate and verify these claims in advance. Thirdly, I'm very concerned with the process, a process that deems this application complete when there's so much information yet to be determined a process that during the pre-consultation meeting accepts a 10-story, 233-unit high-rise apartment building. We all knew that the high-rise apartment building did not belong there. Why did planning staff not remove the apartment building right off the bat during the pre-consultation meetings? They had two chances to do so. At the conclusion of the June 8th meeting, it was clear that the high-rise was a no-go, no going to fly too much intensification, we need compatibility. I'm of the opinion that the apartment building was used as a bargaining chip. It gives the impression that the developer and this council are negotiating in good faith. I'm also concerned by the piecemeal approach that allows the applicant to reveal the impacts on these lands a little bit at a time. Remove a few trees at a time and soon there will be no trees left and no, no one would notice. While the St. Anne School seems a high priority on June 8th public meeting, and including mentioned tonight that it was a high priority, it is now a phase four component of the development. Why? The focus should remain on the cumulative effects of the negative impacts. Unfortunately, the piecemeal approach has been and continues to be very effective for the developer. I am concerned with the applicability of section 5134 of the Planning Act, which allows the applicant to appeal this application 120 days from the day this application is deemed complete, even though it has changed several times, lacks critical information, and is considered premature. How are we supposed to have any trust in this process? It is not fair or transparent, and it should be. In conclusion, it is my opinion this public planning meeting accomplishes only one thing, it grants council the authority to say that there are two public meetings already on this application and the next move will be to go straight to the general committee meeting. This is a strategy used in phase two and furthermore avoids more public scrutiny. Collectively, we have an obligation to protect these environmental features and wildlife. Unfortunately, the way phase three is progressing, history will repeat. And we all know past behavior is indicative of future behavior. Thank you. Thank you, George. Next up, we have the Zintra Schlatter. Did I say that correct? The Zintra. 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 
I apologize. Thank you very much for coming. If I could just get you to state your name and your address and you have five minutes. I am Sintra Schlaughter and I'm a resident of Aurora, 30 year resident of St. Andrews on the Hill, just uh, immediately south of the subdivision. Um, I, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council uh, and fellow residents and members from um, Shining Hill representatives. Um, I do want to first off say thank you uh, for Shining Hill representatives to, uh, to the fact that they did try and address some of the issues that we brought forward. I'm not going to reiterate what my fellow uh, residents have, have already addressed. I just want to add um, to, the, to the concern. In looking at the um, subdivision plan, there is a road and, uh, on slide 17, Mr. Given. Um, it shows what the overall development is going to be in both Newmarket and in Aurora. What I don't understand is why is the road that um, connects from St. John's side road uh, or the, that leads into the subdivision, why does it connect to a road that goes through into New Market and consequently gives access for the entire New Market subdivision to have access to St. John's Side Road. By eliminating that access, by breaking the road so that it is not joined between Aurora and New Market, and I believe it's labeled as Street A on uh, slide 17. If that road was uh, not communicating through into Newmarket, it would restrict the traffic onto St. John's side road to the subdivision that is proposed only. Uh, residents of Aurora would have direct access to St. Andrew's School. And I see from the slide 17 that Newmarket would have access to St. Andrew's School as well. So by eliminating that, main road to be a through road, um, it now allows to not have a dramatic increase in the amount of traffic that St. John Side Road will have to bear. And as mentioned in the previous meeting, we know that there is no uh, funds allocated for the next 10 years to have any kind of increase to uh, St. John Side Road to four lanes. Um, the and also having been a resident for 30 years now in St. Andrews Hill to the councillors, I'd like to point out that it was witnessed that when that subdivision was developed, St. Andrews on the Hill and Willow Farm Lane was to go to Tree Grove Circle, which would then go up to Bathurst. On Hodgkinson, one of the crescents that was supposed to be a lovely quiet crescent, they put a little throughway, Storrington Gate, which now gave access to the subdivisions south of that area, all the way to Orchard Heights, Aurora Heights. And consequently, what has happened is that that access point has created a shortcut for everybody south of Aurora who doesn't want to have to travel on Young Street or Bathurst to come through the residential area. This same proposal, the same thing will happen that you will have a dramatic increase in the amount of traffic if you're giving access from the new market subdivision down through Aurora. I was the one who proposed and asked uh, whether or not there could be an east-west route that would connect to uh, Bathurst and Young Street. Um, and that would eliminate some of the traffic onto St. John's Side Road. I do see from the plan that it would have major interruption through the uh, heritage land sites, the natural sites, and, and that would not be appropriate. But I do see that there is already an existence in the proposed plan in Newmarket that there is an east-west route for the Newmarket development to go through and access Bathurst and Young Street. So they have access to two major roads already. I don't see the need that they have to access St. John Side Road because that will become a shortcut and it is not um, a, a four lane road the way that Bathurst and Young Street is. So if that road could be interrupted or, or taken off the plan so that there is not a direct communication, I think it would have a dramatic uh, impact in decreased volume of traffic 
coming out onto St. John's side road. Um, also, the um, just the uh, the second issue that I wanted to uh, just ask about was the in seeing the slide where the potential tree compensation areas are along uh, the street A in particular. It's all along the back side of the single dwelling homes. Um, again, referring back to St. Andrews on the Hill, any of the homes that were developed on the natural uh, conservation area there, uh, the, the building lots, part of the back of the building lot, a minimum 30 to 50 feet of those homes was all left as natural conservation. We're not allowed to touch the trees, can't do any modification into that property, can't use it for pools or et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the builder was able to very easily build the homes without removal of any of the trees in those areas. So although it is a fabulous idea that you're going to replant, I'm just wondering why disturb in the back half of those lots? Why disturb any of the trees at all? Why not leave it natural if you're able to do that and, and increase the buffer, the natural buffer between the heritage uh, land sites and the proposed um, home building lots as well. This is thank you. I, yeah, thank you. I got you at six minutes. I let you go a little bit longer just to finish up, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, next we have Gordon Logan. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor members of the council and uh, colleagues, neighbours and folks from Shining Hills. Thank you for your time. Um, I'd really like to, uh, Sintra's kind of stolen correct better than I would ever be able to deliver it, some of my thunder, but um, perhaps a small storm and from to, to back up what she said. Um, I have a couple of questions at the end, but my concern as was the previous meeting is really about traffic and planning. Um, just to follow up with Sintra said, I think there is an issue with uh, cut through from New Market to St. John Side Road. And I think that's a, a question that needs to be uh, dealt with. But if we look at the, um, I'd like to refer to the actual public planning report that was part of the uh, appendices that were sent out with the uh, meeting request. And if I specifically refer to some of the comments that Mr. Given made, but referring to this report, um, the appendices are, uh, the one I want to talk about is on page eight. And it's uh, item three, which is traffic on St. John Side Road. And I do respect what Mr. Given said about the master, the York Region Master Plan does look at into turning St. John Side Road into a four lane uh, highway, but it doesn't say when. Um, it's a proposal. Um, I think there's a, a, a bunch of observations within this plan that looks at, uses the words assumptions, proposed. Um, timelines are not determined. This is a little bit of a concern that the development goes ahead and some significant assumptions are made. And one of them, for obvious reasons, is the traffic flow on St. John's Side Road as managed by the master plan by York. And as Sintra pointed out, although it's a 10-year plan, there is actually nothing that says that this will get done in the next 10 years, the four-lane highway. Um, so that's um, one thing. And then the observation that they will try and widen the road from uh, Willow, the uh, north side of Willow Farm down to Young Street. Um, that again is an assumption. It's a bridge structure. It's assumed that something will be done. Uh, it needs to be more definite than this. Either if you're going to put a development like this into this part of Aurora, the roadways have to, have to be part, it can't be an assumption or a proposal. It has to be a definite understanding that this will take place, which I understand is a challenge with the, the master plan. So that was item, th it's a, Point three on page 32 of the report. Then turning to item four, which is the increased traffic. Again, these were responses to questions that were raised in the previous meeting. Increased traffic onto subdivision based, based primarily on the premise that there will be traffic from uh, parents and guardians delivering children and students from into St. Anne's, etc. And I do respect what uh, Mr. Given said that taking away the multi-story uh, apartment block compensation is that there'll be less traffic now uh, and that we managed. I think the observation is that it's it's just less worse. It's not better, it's just less worse. The reason I'd say this is turning left onto St John's side road right now is hazardous. I know that because uh, my address is in the public uh, 
planning department know my address. I live in Aurora and I'm very familiar with the access to Cliff Trail turning left uh, onto St. John side road. There were there already been a request to put some sort of pedestrian crossing into McKinley Gate and Cliff Trail in the past because of the traffic management challenges we have when people are turning left. If there's a, if there are, and I quote, 275 outbound trips from St. Anne's, how are they going to possibly get across turning left into St. John Side Road at peak periods? The traffic management or the uh, holdup of traffic on Street A is going to be considerable going both ways at night, and in the morning and at night. So that was one observation I would make that it's still not, the traffic management of this development is significant. It needs to be taken into account when the proposal uh, goes forward. As I say, there already were, there's been two traffic incidents just in the last two weeks on Cliff Trail, turning into uh, St. John Side Road. And um, again, the police were involved and um, there was an injury in one of them. This is not gonna change. And St. Anne's is going to be even more difficult I'm not saying insurmountable, just more difficult. And then again, looking at item six, uh, it's page 10 of 17 on the appendices. It's page 34 of 42 in the report for tonight. Um, it's this issue of a uh, pathway uh, on the north side of St. John's. I'm, I'm getting concerned that we always hear the word um, exploring the potential of a pathway. If it's already acknowledged that we're not going to have a dual carry, a four lane highway on St. John's for some time, I think it needs to be clear that there will be a path for residents on the north side of St. John's, if nothing else for phase two and for phase three. So this needs to be part of the plan. It can't be exploring. I'm not sure exploring doesn't mean a great deal to me in real terms. It needs to be actually part of the proposal, given that we've just understood that there is no plan for four lanes on um, St. John's for, for in the current period, uh, time period. Um, and then lastly, my two observations really to support what others have said. Um, I'm, I, I appreciate, as Sintra has said, I do appreciate the fact that we don't have uh, a tower, uh, multi-story apartment, and it's good that we have less housing, but I'm curious, my question is why townhouses and not single family dwellings? It's a question not necessarily needs to be answered tonight. And then this, the potential of the tree compensation plan is a potential, yet again, it's this, these use of preliminary words, uh, not, def, not definite words, potential compensation. It either has to be or it hasn't. I think it needs to be you know, cleared up. And that's my uh, observations uh, on, on the latest plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Mr. Waters, um, did you want to... Did you want to answer the one of uh, why staff allowed this to come forward? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, could you repeat that, please? Why staff allowed this application to come forward? Certainly, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, an applicant has a right to make an application under the Planning Act. Um, and once they make that application, um, we are obligated to review it um, and bring it forward to um, public planning uh, at at an early stage of the of the process so that we can get public input as to the plan itself from council and also from residents as well. Thank you. Um, I guess the rest of them are for the applicant. Uh, Mr. Givens, if you wanted to jump on here and I'm gonna throw some questions at you. Uh, uh, I know that uh, there's questions about uh, about the traffic and the flow and how tough it is to turn left. It's my understanding. I think we discussed this before. Are, are we looking at a, a full service light at Willow Farm Lane in St. John's? Mr. Evans, are you there? There, I was muted, I apologize. Um, we are looking at a full um, signal. Uh, that's always been the intent. Um, I, I appreciate the concerns about traffic. They are, uh, you're living in an environment where huge population increases are expected throughout the GTA and it's increasing the load on our roads everywhere. Uh, it's not as simple as uh, just 
shut development down. The population is coming and we're trying to deal with it as quickly and as best as we can dealing with the infrastructure. We don't have the luxury of having a natural grid system in this area because the way the ground is breaking, breaks the uh, site apart and limits opportunities to create new road systems. Uh, the to concern about when ha well, the widening will take place on St. John's is something that's been raised before. Uh, usually those are uh, sort of demand response of the, when the region comes to look at their budget, they do it on the basis of where are the needs for, of their money's uh, best spent. And uh, they do it in response to traffic generation. Uh, and as traffic increases, they refocus. Uh, for example, on the east side of um, Young Street, uh, the widening has already been incorporated into the road fabric and uh, it took place as a result of the growth that was occurring on the north side and on the south side. Uh, that forced that to happen, included uh, dealing with the marsh in a very, uh, I thought, innovative way so that it becomes a major feature for the community. I don't know how we're going to deal with the walkway crossing on the bridge, but I think it's a key issue that we would like to address with the residents and with the uh, council uh, to find out how we can do that on some kind of interim basis until we get the longer term solution. But my client is committed to connecting out to Young Street in some form or fashion. Thank you. Um, and then I guess continuing on roads, that the one question about the road on slide 17 that continues north from Willow Farm uh, and into the new market um, proposal. Uh, why well, have I, that road continue? I, I, as I said before, in a perfect world, and you'll see this in the guidance documents we have from the region, you should have in every block uh, two north, south and two east, west collector roads running through the blocks. We're limited in what we can do here because of the fabric that already exists and because of the natural heritage features. But one, one road is uh, a, certainly a necessity to deal with traffic. You can't flush it all onto Young Street. Young Street at the intersection of St. John's and um, Young is already uh, having traffic uh, loading problems. What we're trying to do is find alternative ways to move people around using the opportunity through this development to move people from Bathurst to Young Street, Young Street to Bathurst and up into the, you know, the blocks to the north. But it's never an easy situation. Traffic is a part of an urbanizing community like yours that we have to deal with constantly. Um, we will do the best we can, but we can't, um, we can't stop uh, the road at the boundary of the municipality. That would just be, I think, uh, uh, ignoring the responsibilities we have to try to find solutions. And um, why disturb any trees in the behind? Why couldn't you do the same as what was done over uh, Willow Farm Lane? Well, we, we behind the houses, we aren't disturbing trees. Remember, we're setting back from the valley wall or from the drip line. Uh, but what we're talking about is actually planting in that area where we are setting back. Uh, and what we did is we deliberately shaved all the lots at the back of the wall because we had a basically an offset from the uh, the drip line of 10 meters or, or six meters, depending on where we were. Uh, and what we said, look, let's just regularize these lots so that uh, the surplus can be used for planting. And that's what I pointed out to you in the drawings that we do plan on putting more trees in the backyards. Okay, and um, last one I got, and I'll ask Mr. Waters if he has any others, but why townhouses and not single? family dwellings on, on the new proposed where the mid, mid high rise block was? You know, we're supposed to be planning to accommodate all forms of uh, requirements for housing uh, and town housing uh, in, in some ways is becoming the most affordable product for a lot of people. Uh, we think it's an appropriate location for it. Why do they have to be in uh, substandard locations? This is a beautiful site and we think it's a, an area that could handle townhouses in an attractive way next to a major amenity and off opposite the school. Um, why does it all have to be single family? We want a variety of housing types and meet a variety of housing markets. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Mr. Waters, did you catch any other questions out of that? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll leave the natural heritage questions to Don Gibbon and his consulting team. I believe there was a question as to why the um, future north-south connection cannot be offset from Willow Farm to the south. Um, and I believe the region will not allow for a jogged intersection. It would be absolute nightmare uh, 
for turning uh, left turning movements. So that's why uh, that location was selected in consultation with the region. That's my understanding. Um, uh, I think that's it. I, most of them were on natural heritage uh, at the beginning of the uh, delegation by Ms. Kenyon. Thank you. So we're gonna go through, so I have a couple of speakers for a second time from the public. It's Wendy Kenyon. Wendy? Hello. Uh, hi, Wendy. If I could just get you this. Hi. hi. <laughs> Let me just start my, I hate this. I really wish that we were back in person, but here uh, we are. Um, absolutely. I, we, we would all like to see you in person as well. But um, I know. I know. Well, at least I don't have to change my bottom half, so that's fine. <laughs> well, hopefully <laughs> soon enough. But if I could just get you to state your name again and your address once again, and you have five minutes. For sure. Uh, Wendy Kenyon, uh, resident of Aurora, you have my address. Um, so, members of council, um, I'd like to talk to you about the barn swallow nest because you know this story, and I believe it exemplifies why residents, in fact, all of us, should be so concerned about the quality of information being fed to council and upon which a critical decision is about to be made. On June 15th, 2020, a breeding pair of threatened species barn swallow was, and an active nest were recorded on the property by the applicant's representative, Beacon Environmental. And in fact, the CEO, Brian Henshaw is here tonight. When Beacon returned 10 days later, the structure in which the nest was located had been demolished and the state of the status of the nest simply recorded in the report as unknown. At the June public planning meeting, I asked what had happened to this nest and why the structure had been removed when the Conservation Authority had instructed the applicant not to do any site clearing during the breeding bird season. Mr. Given replied that Beacon would not recommend that type of removal and that if they could, they get in the way of it. But evidently, Beacon didn't get in the way. So I'm still asking, why was this nest not protected? And why was the structure removed during a period that was restricted, not only by the Conservation Authority, but also under the Federal Migratory Bird Convention Act and the Provincial Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act? I'd also like to address some inconsistencies. In July, I was told by the planning department that upon prior inspection of the structure, the demolition crew did not see an active nest before it was dismantled. However, in the latest staff report, the applicant's response now says, at the time of demolition, it's unclear whether a barn swallow nest was still present in the structure. And that confirms Mr. Gibbon's statement earlier tonight. But this further contradicts the Conservation Authority's own report of June 14th, which refers, and I quote, confirmed barn swallow habitat active nest that was removed during the breeding bird season. I have to say I'm appalled by the continued smoke and mirrors, the lack of accountability. This is totally unacceptable. So what happened to this nest? A planning department email to me said, if an active nest was found on the structure, demolition would have been stopped, the nest reported to the Natural Heritage Inter Information Center, and a barn swallow mitigation and restoration record submitted prior to the demolition. The fact is, the nest was there on June 15th, and 10 days later, it was gone. I'm mindful of the fact that barn swallows often produce two broods a year, and reuse the same nest in July or August and often in subsequent years. So it was apparently lucky then that the demolition crew didn't see a nest and also surprising because the structure was small and barn swallow nests are very visible. Also nest building takes seven to 14 days, incubation a, four, a further 14, fledglings leave the nests 20 days after hatching and parental post care lasts about seven days. So in a logical world, nesting activity would still have been very evident at the time. 
What's particularly concerning about all of this is the fact that other species at risk are also present on this property. Breeding pairs of the threatened species bobo link and chimney swift, the special concern eastern wood peewee, the potential for endangered bats. Shining Hill is currently the steward of these environmentally sensitive lands, yet from what I've seen, in honesty, this developer is failing in this role and also falling well short of the title Lake Simcoe Steward, a sponsorship title it purchased for $20,000 from the Lake Simcoe Foundation. The planning department recently told me the developer will likely be required as a condition of approval to provide new habitat as compensation. However, a replacement structure to build to be built at some point in the future does not and cannot compensate for the immediate loss of that nest and the appalling consequences to that pair of threatened species as well as its young. In conclusion, I'm asking what council thinks of this, because if Shining Hill is simply asked to add a new nesting structure to its to-do list, costing this large developer a small amount of pocket change, this will speak volumes as to the town we have become. And I'd like to think we're far, far better than that. Council, Councillor Gilliland made this comment at the June meeting. She said, we wouldn't want it to seem that we don't care about a threatened species nest. I ask that council shows us that it does care, not just about this particular nest, but about all the species on these lands here in Aurora that need proper protection. Thank you. Thank you. Council, I have Mr. Skoulakis again for a second time. George, if I can get you to state your name and your address once again, and you'll have five minutes. Uh, yes, um, thank you. <clears throat> George Skoulakis, Aurora resident. Um, with all due respect, um, Mr. Maracas, Mayor Maracas, uh, my question, um, the way you posed it was not the question that I was asking during my delegation. My question was not why the application went forth. My question was more specifically that during the pre-consultation uh, meeting, and they had two of them, why was the 10 story apartment building with 233 units allowed to, to be part of this application when we know in fact that um, the pre-consultation meetings are to uh, understand the proposal and that for the applicant to explain their proposal and then for the town to provide some feedback. So that was my question. Now why this application went forth? Um, However, um, I'm hoping that I'll get an answer to that uh, later. But I've got one more question um, uh, to um, uh, re regarding um, regarding the uh, the tree inventory, and, and that is um, there was a snag survey that was completed last year and was done. And uh, my question to Mr. Henshaw, uh, Hen Henshaw was, is why um, the uh, snack survey was not submitted as part of the documents. Um, so uh, that's my question to Mr. Uh, Henshaw. Um, regarding the, the um, planning staff uh, report tonight, I'd like to know why the school all of a sudden uh, is no longer, um, sorry, while it's been considered now to be a phase four, uh, why it was not mentioned in the staff report, nor was it mentioned during the presentation. So I'm assuming that, um, you know, phase four, that would necessitate a new uh, development uh, plan. And, and, you know, sh should the phase three uh, development plan boundaries change because we're not dealing with the school anymore. So th those are my questions and uh, thank you. Thank you, George. Next we have Zintra. Once again, for a second time, Zintra, if you could just mention your, say your name and your address and you'll have five minutes. Thank you, Zintra Schlatter, and I'm a resident of Aurora. Um, I do not feel, Mr. Given and, and um, counselors, 
that um, an appropriate answer was given with respect to the why the road has to go through uh, from, from Aurora to Newmarket. The builder has purchased land in two separate towns. I think uh, the town of Aurora needs to address Aurora's needs. I think that if the new market subdivision requires another uh, north-south exit, they can exit into new market onto Mulock um, and, and to investigate that uh, possibility. Um, and again, in that respect, it would decrease significantly the amount of traffic on St. John's side road. Mr. Given, I know that there are challenges on Young Street and Bathurst Street at any intersection um, along its full length, quite frankly. Uh, however, Bathurst and Young Street are already four lane roads. Uh, St. John's side road is not. And from your report from the June 5th um, meeting or the earlier in June, St. John's side road traffic report indicates that it is already at rush hour times operating uh, beyond its peak capacity. And that's at the current status. Uh, so given any further sub uh, development along the roads will make it a nightmare to try and turn on to the road itself. And as I said, I come off of Willow Farm Lane in the morning during rush hour to even try and turn onto St. John's Side Road is a nightmare. To turn right, to turn left is well beyond the documented 20 second increase point of time, which is what was commented on that that's how much longer it takes you to get on the road. That is not a true statement at all. And in 30 years, I have been a resident in this area there is not a sidewalk on St. John's Side Road yet in 30 years. So I don't foresee that in the next five to 10 years that that will happen as well, unless it is an official town plan. And again, before the subdivision goes through, I think as um, um, uh, my other resident George there pointed out that uh, proposals are or assumptions should not be in the wording of this uh, acceptance of this proposal, it needs to be that it is definite plan for the roadways, for the walkways, for the, for the preservation of the natural setting, not that we're assuming things will happen because things will assumingly happen years down the road, but we need answers and solutions for today, not for 20 or 30 years down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Zintra. I got Gordon Logan one more time. Gordon, if you could just state your name and your address again, and you have five minutes. I'll try and do it better this time. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Gordon Logan. I'm a resident of Aurora, and the planning team have my actual postal address and residential address. Um, I just, again, Sintra's kind of stolen my thunder, but my small storm continues. Mr. Given, I appreciate the uh, challenges we all have with traffic management and growth and uh, you know it's not unexpected that this is going to be a challenge for this development um, but it's never been unexpected and back to back again supporting what Sintra has said I'm very concerned about the uses of words exploring possibilities that means it could be explored and it might not be possible for a path on the north side of St John's as per the report page appendices page 10 of 17 so it's page 34 42 in the report for the team. Um, I do think it needs to be, as Sintra has pointed out, it needs to be part and parcel of the development. And I understand it's a multi-agency issue, but the what are we waiting for? We're we waiting for a real uh, traffic incident. We had two on St. John's just the last two weeks where someone was injured and finished up in hospital. What does it take for the traffic management on St. John's side road with further development from phase two and this proposed development? not to be taken into account. We don't want to be thinking after the fact that this conversation has taken place and to find that someone's had an accident. And I'm not for a second using that as a proof statement to make that clear. I want nothing, nothing but good for everybody. Um, but I do feel it needs to be part and parcel of, of this proposal. And then the um, my question was, uh, why townhouses, not single family homes? I, I appreciate Mr. Gibbons' opinion that there's, we should have mixed dwellings on that um, site but it's gone from a, a 
a uh, high density uh, building to townhouses and away from family homes. My question wasn't actually answered. I want to know what procedure, why, what procedure, well, I'll ask it a different way. What procedure went, we, did we go through in order to take that from, from a high density building down to townhouses and not single family homes like the rest of the uh, area? And I think the fact, as Mr Gibbon pointed out, that it's, there's some connection with the school. Again, I'm not entirely re clear why a, a private organisation like a private school should have anything to do with whether townhouses are built on or fa single family homes. I'm, I'm unclear about that, but maybe someone can educate me there. So once again, I just want to reiterate that the traffic management process and the plans and the explore, I'm, where, I'm very concerned about the use of some of the words here. And, and it, yeah, it may happen, everything may happen, but a lot of pieces have to fall into place to make everybody feel comfortable uh, that traffic management is being looked after in this proposal. And then the issue of the um, low density uh, housing challenge, I, I'm not sure I got the right answer from Mr. Gibbons' team there, or Mr. Gibbons, rather. And that was it, really. It was just to reiterate what so I've already said and what Sintra has um, uh, previously said. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'm actually going to answer the one about why, why this. Um, why staff allowed this to come to council, as was mentioned, uh, under under legislation, under the public planning, uh, under the Municipal Act, uh, any applicant is allowed to put forward any application that they see fit as far as they want to put forward. I can tell you for a fact that staff discouraged them from putting forward those buildings. I discouraged them from putting forward those buildings. They know that those buildings are unacceptable, um, but they are, they are allowed to, under the law, bring that forward. It, this is something that we've argued about and we fought about for, for decades. And this is something that the provincial government needs to fix. That's this. This is their process that they bestowed upon us as a municipal council to to adhere to. It's not something we like. If 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 it was the way that we wanted, we wouldn't be getting an application for two ten-story buildings at the corner of Industrial and Wellington. We wouldn't have got a proposal for the United Church with a nine-story building where we had to work with them to try to bring it down. That wouldn't be happening. That is the process. They are allowed to bring it forward. It's not a good one. We're going to continue to fight to make sure that the province makes those changes, but that's the process that's in front of us. Uh, why is the school not mentioned in the staff report or in the application, Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, all we know for certain is that uh, St. Andrews College, the girls' school, will be locating in the estate home. Um, I don't. We have not seen any expansion plans. They have not been submitted to us. Um, all they're working with, at, as my understanding, is to allow for 40 students uh, come uh, next school year. Uh, there will be expansions to it. We just haven't received any applications to show those at this time. Thank you, Mr. Waters. And did you get that third question about the natural heritage? I didn't hear it clearly. I'll get, I see that he's, George has his hand up again, so I'll ask him that, that one again. Um, Mr. Givens, could you elaborate on the townhomes once again? Pleased to. Yes, what I meant when I was linking it to the school is that uh, if we can get teachers to live close to the school where they could walk uh, to where they're teaching, uh, it would be an advantage. Uh, but most teachers aren't in a position to afford large single family homes. So I thought this was a way in which we might be able to uh, both provide an accommodation that would suit the school and also minimize uh, traffic. And I would remind you too that on the uh, current approvals that are in place in that area that we're talking about would allow for 350 apartment units. We're asking for a few townhouses instead. Um, and I, Mr. Logan did raise the question of the path on the north, north side and the, uh, the, he wants it to be real or, or be a commitment. My client has, and you have heard that yourself, Mr. Mayor, uh, committed to delivering that. Normally, it would be a municipal responsibility to build above the curb, 
the type of pedestrian connections that you have on a regional road. My client is shouldering that responsibility through this application process because he's heard from the residents and wants to deliver a safe condition. Thank you, Mr. Evans. And one that I didn't get from last time is that there's a lot of use of the word potential, and especially when it comes to the tree comp compensation. Um, is the tree compensation uh, potentially that number of trees, or are, is the applicant and the application going to adhere to our tree compensation policy? We are adhering to your tree compensation policy. And I mentioned the number of trees that would have to be planted, somewhere over 1,300 trees. That will all be imposed on us through the conditions of the plan of subdivision. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Waters, I think that's all I have at this time. If I could just clarify the phase four reference. Uh, so, sure. Sorry for interrupting, Mr. Mayor. No. Uh, when we use that term, and I think it may have come from our reports, uh, we have made three other applications. Uh, phase one, which you know in Newmarket is under construction. Phase two, which you've approved. And then we applied in Newmarket, and we called that phase three uh, because it was our third application. And in writing our reports at the time, we called this phase four, not to be meant to be sort of a delay, um, I think it's probably better for we call it phase three as we go forward for the entire subdivision process, uh, just to remove that confusion because Newmarket is going to lag behind uh, the St. Anne's uh, site and, the, and this uh, subdivision. But it, it's probably our fault for that confusion is in our reports. Okay, thank you. And actually, um, Mr. Waters, I just want to ask because I know that there are some comments in regards to the road uh, going north from Willow Farm into proposed new market uh, application uh, and the fact that can we stop it or whatever. But uh, essentially, if we ever do get an to an approval, I'm not saying that we will, but if we ever do, uh, there would be a three meter reserve on that road. And until our staff was satisfied with any resolutions coming out of the new market proposal, we would not release that three meter reserve. Is that correct? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, that is absolutely correct. Um, and just to point out that this, um, the development in Newmarket is being planned, uh, sorry, the development in Aurora is being planned for Aurora. We're planning for Aurora, we're not planning for Newmarket, but there will be a three meter reserve, um, which the town will have to lift to allow access to the north. Okay, thank you. So I will go to our third time. Uh, George, I'm gonna start with you because I just didn't wanna get you that, get that question off of you that I didn't get uh, in regards to the natural heritage. So if, did you wanna start again? Uh, if I could get you to state your name again and your address and you have five minutes. Sorry, which question that you're referring to? You, you asked that one the last time you spoke in regards to the natural heritage. I, I didn't hear you, it was a little bit muffled. So I didn't get a chance. I thought Mr. Waters wrote it down, but we didn't, we didn't get it. Uh, I, that, that might have been Wendy's question. I think my question was about the snags uh, survey, but I, 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 I do have some more questions if you want to continue with me. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I hate to correct Mr. Waters once more, but, but year one, the, the school population will be, the student population will be 115, uh, 100. Uh, students and 15 staff. Year five, uh, we're, they're looking at 435 and 65 staff. So those numbers are going to be higher than than what what uh, you're you're suggesting. But that that's not quite my question. Uh, so my my question is regarding the uh, traffic uh, survey, and uh, that's uh, I think to Mr. Given. The traffic survey is a draft report right now. And it is my understanding that even though they did um, current 2023 and 2028 projections, they, the traffic report did not take into account the phases in, in new market. I, I think that's a major flaw you know, for, for, sorry, for 2028. So that's a major flaw that, uh, you know, they, they won't take uh, approximately 3,000 uh, uh, units uh, of uh, development in the rest of the phases for Shining Hill. So I don't understand how that traffic report is even acceptable at, at this stage. Um, 
So that that's one of the questions that I have for uh, Mr. Given. And and obviously the snack survey uh, has not been answered yet. So um, I think it's important that we we know um, you know the information on the snag. Uh, survey and um, an, another quick question for for Mr. Um, and this is more for a clarification. This is for Mr. Given, uh, Mr. Given, uh, in your uh, letter of August twentieth, in your cover letter, uh, uh, in your second uh, submission of this uh, point number three, states that the public road frontage and access within Aurora will be provided to the St. Anne School via Block One Ten. Um, I don't understand how Block 110 comes into play because Block 110, according to your development uh, plans, is the road widening for for um, uh, St. John's uh, side road. So if that's the case, it, it it seems to me that perhaps there's a direct north south directly from the from the school to to the St. John's side road. So I'm not, if you can clarify that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, George. Next, we have Wendy Kenyon. Wendy, if I could get you to state your name again and your address, and you have five minutes, please. I have to unmute myself. Am I unmuted? Uh, is that my video? I'm sorry. I, I wish this was done in person because this is awful. But here I am. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so I'm confused by the recent comment made, made by the applicant, including the latest staff report, item eight, in response to the question, is there another report on endangered species? The answer was... The NHE was, was prepared in accordance with the Endangered Species Act. There is no separate report for regulated species, nor is one required. Uh, due to the potential endangered species habitat, a, 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 a big button, a, a bat snag survey was conducted by Beacon on May 6, 2020. Uh, the Conservation Authority has requested to see it but as of mid-August, hadn't received it. I mention this because Beacon's Arborist Report, March 2021, refers to 171 trees recommended for removal due to their condition, including those described as potential risk, declining, death imminent, or dead. However, many of these are also referred in Appendix B of the staff inventory as standing snags, it's critical the developer doesn't remove any snags prematurely and during the bat season when snags are still being used by maternity roost habitat. To my knowledge, acoustic monitoring hasn't yet been undertaken to determine the potential impacts of the extended stormwater management infrastructure through potential suitable habitat for endangered bats. Uh, perhaps Mr. Henshaw can uh, talk about this, but can the applicant please explain why the snag survey hasn't yet been submitted and when can we expect to see it? Um, incidentally, um, Mr. Henshaw uh, will recall that at the Henderson uh, Forest LPAT hearing, uh, he said that uh, there was no endangered bat um, habitat because they would not seen it, but as the town's, uh, the town's lawyer said, if you don't look for it, you won't see it. So my question is to Mr. Henshaw, are you going to look for the endangered bat habitat this time? And if you do see it, are you going to protect it? Um, and incidentally, should there now be a separate report regarding the removal of the active barn swallow nest as this would also fall under the Endangered Species Act. Um, perhaps someone could please clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Sintra? 
I can get you to state your name again and your address and you have five minutes. Thank you. Yes, and Trish Schlaughter and I'm a resident of Aurora. Um, again, I just want to um, confirm uh, that the if the traffic report did not include the future subdivision of potentially three, I believe that you said 3,000 residences in Newmarket, if it only addressed the increased traffic flow from the phase uh, uh, four, if that's what you want to call it, um, going down that street A onto St. John side road, why is there even a consideration for a communication of the road between Newmarket and Aurora? Because that will have a major impact in the future if 3,000 potential homeowners can be traveling down onto St. John side road, as opposed to the 188, I believe, what is, is proposed at this point, plus the, the traffic from the school. So again, I urge the councillors to look and review what is the benefit? Why are they trying to connect the subdivision? I realize the, the developer has purchased a large parcel of land, but it is two separate towns. And I do not see the need that there has to be a communication um, on, of a subsidiary road. Uh, from Newmarket to Aurora through a residential subdivision. And again, it will have major impacts on St. John's Side Road and to the other residential areas in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon Logan. Gordon, if I could get you to state your name again and your address and you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, my name is Gordon Logan. I'm a resident of Aurora and the planning team have my uh, address. Um, I just really like to, first of all, um, I appreciate Mr. Mayor and all of your councillor colleagues and everybody in the planning department, the amount of effort and challenges it takes dealing with planning applications. I'm not worthy of understanding how much you have to go through to get through that, but you know, I, I do sympathise entirely. I'm just really um, responding to a comment from Mr. Gibbon. I appreciate his, his response with respect to the path on the north side of St. John's Side Road, but I, I really I got a little bit confused with the English uh, interpretation of uh, the response on page 34 of 42 on the planning report. It, it states, and I quote, the applicant has committed to constructing a multi-use path on the north side of St. John's Side Road within the region's roadway to the extent practical. I'm assuming that depends on the master plan and uh, some agreement with the region. And it's the extent practical that confused it got me. It's, it lacked precision. And if there is practical, why do we have to have an alternative proposal which is being explored with respect to a road a pathway on the north side of St. John's? I just like some assurance that the developer is going to, in one way, shape or form, put a path on the north side of St. John's Road for pedestrians on that, on that side of the road. It's just it's just perhaps the way it was, uh, I interpreted the uh, response uh, with respect to with respect to what Mr. Given said, maybe I'm, I'm confused, but um, if it's part of the region plan, as we've already stated, the region plan is there isn't much going on on that side of St. John's Side Road from the region's perspective, maybe for 10 years. And if there is an alternative, um, being looked at by the applicant instead of being an explored possibility, I'd just like it to be firmed up. It's just a question of precision. So it's just a response to um, uh, Mr. Given, and um, I appreciate what he said. I do appreciate his uh, response, and but uh, it's just a question of precision. I just like it a bit more firm, if you like. There is a path going in one way, shape, or form, and it is definitely going to happen as part of this development, including phase two. It includes phase two. That was it. Thank you very much. And once again, I. I have nothing but sympathy for the work that everybody who, who's uh, on the staff and council side of this has to deal with. But thanks again. Thanks for all your support and thank you for all the work you do. Thank you. That was it. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Mr. Henshaw, if I can get you to jump on. Um, obviously, I have two questions. Uh, they both go together in regards to this next survey. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that one. Hello. Yes, uh, I got a little list here of things. Um, all right, you 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 go through them one by one, and I'll make sure you got all the ones that I got as well. So okay, go good, good. Uh, I'm going to start off. I I just I think 
there's nothing nefarious going on with this barn swallow. Um, the original um, confusion came about because I think until people called me, there was some uncertainty around which structure uh, the barn swallows were actually in. And I think originally it was assumed that they were in the big barn or the ice rink building or whatever it was that used to be there. Um, and that was incorrect. The barn swallow nest was in a very small uh, horse um, shelter uh, that was built in the fence uh, that kept the horses in. And it's quite true. Uh, it was very accurately stated that we found an active nest there. It was, all, all we do um, two or three breeding bird surveys depending on the circumstances. And when we went back to do the second survey, we didn't expect anything to have changed. And there was no clearance of any buildings or, or vegetation. So it was totally uh, sort of not expected that someone had removed the fence, which is, you know, normally wouldn't be a big deal, except it happened that on that fence was this horse stall. And in that horse stall previous, previously was a, an active barn swallow nest. So that's the true story of what happened. And the people who removed the barn stall, and this is not direct information that I have, but it's my understanding that at the time they removed it, and it was very small, uh, they, they observed no swallows. Now, that doesn't make a hill of beans a difference to me. Um, I'm, I can only tell you that they were there, and then they were, and then it was removed. Uh, and I just would point out that on page 49 of our NHE, uh, that is stated exactly as it happened. Uh, what well, the client said to me, oh, my God, what should I do? Uh, you know, this happened. I had no idea. And I said, well, if uh, we'd have gone through the process, um, the stall would have been removed after the breeding season. And you would have had to build a structure uh, in the valley lands to account for uh, barn swallows to give them a place to nest. And so uh, my client said, OK, well, we're going to do that. Uh, that's what we'll do as if we were going through the process. Now, the fact that people are saying that they didn't see any barn swallows at the time it was removed is just information from the people that removed uh, the structure. I would expect them to still be there. They didn't see them. I can't say categorically that the barn swallows were or weren't there because I wasn't there on the day. Regardless, the nest structure, unless it had been removed by a predator, would still be regulated under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, because uh, vacant barn swallow nests are regulated by the Act. But at, um, as a matter of fact, we don't know whether the nest was still there or not. And so I think the proponent is doing the right thing here by offering to put the structure in the valley. So hopefully, I mean, we were very transparent about what happened. It's right there in Section 9.7 of our report. While I'm dealing with the Endangered Species Act, because it's also the bat issue, i just like to correct... Um, a statement that was made by um, one of the um, citizen participants. She mentioned the species bobolink. There were no bobolink on this property. Oh, there um, are. Yeah, there are. It's in your report. Wendy, Wendy, can I ask you not to interrupt? I, I beg your pardon, but it's in the report. Hi, Wendy, please. I, sorry, uh, uh, I, I, I believe we may be getting mixed up with the, with the report that deals with the new market lands. Uh, we don't have bobolink on. I'm sorry, but it's the aurora. When, Wendy, we're going to have to mute you because we, we have to allow them to speak. And then I would ask you for your time. That's the process uh, that we follow. Yeah. Uh, very rigid with the process when it comes to public planning. Mr. Henshaw? Uh, I, 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 I'm going to, while I'm talking to you, because I can see it's not in the summary of species, uh, there is chimney swift. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, there's some confusion over uh, chimney swift. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at, um, oh, I see that, I do see that there's a, a bobolink. There is a bobolink, it, it appears in the back table. I'll have to get back. I'll have to get back to people on why there's a bobolink in the table, but not in the report. Uh, I noticed in the appendix there's a bobble link there. So I will look into that to find out what's going on and I'll get back to everybody. Um, there was a chimney swift in the uh, nesting in the building and that, that was in our report. I, I, I'm not sure 
uh, why there's bobble ink in the appendix and not in the main, main portion of the report. Uh, it does say on the table three, threatened and endangered species, that the species was not recorded during the breed and bird surveys. Uh, so I think it's a typographic error in the appendix, but I will double check and get back to everyone that that is the case. Um, so that's the bobble link. On the bats, it is true that um, the uh, snag survey was done. And it's also uh, a matter of fact that acoustic monitoring was done. Uh, it, I understand that um, not everybody may be aware of that, but we did say in our report, I'm just going to the page in our report where, so I, so I cite it correctly because I, I don't, I don't want to uh, mislead anybody unintentionally. Um, but we do say in our report that those things would happen. Uh, and, and it says in our report, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote it, um, the, storm, the, the stormwater management infrastructure extends through habitat that's been flagged as suitable habitat for endangered bat studies. And this will need to be addressed through seasonal snag surveys during the leaf off period and possible acoustic monitoring. And the results of that exercise will be provided as an addendum to this NHE and MECP will be consulted to ensure that the ESA is respected. Those, those studies have been done, and not just for that area, but for other areas as well, where the, there, um, there may be a, a road impingement or um, some trees removed that could be potential habitat. And we have actually done that, um, done those surveys and subject to refinement of the exact location of the stormwater discharge, which comes at the next stage of detailed design, uh, we will be approaching MECP. Now, if, if MECP decide that a permit process is required, then there will be a report. Uh, and I'm sure that will be shared in due course. Uh, but at the moment, there is no report. It hasn't been prepared. Uh, what we've done is additional work to determine whether there's bats present and, whether the, and where the snags are located. So hopefully, um, that answers the question. I know it's not completely tight because uh, there is a detailed design step, um, but nothing can be removed until we're in conformity with the Endangered Species Act. Um, so that's where that lies. Uh, I guess the only other thing I've got on my list, I think, is uh, something about the buffers, um, the narrowness of the buffers and the buffers in general. That, in the uh, Natural Heritage Impact uh, and NHE, the, there is several pages of text regarding the buffers. Um, and it, I, I, wanna, I just wanna correct one thing because I, I'm a stickler for trying to get these things right. Uh, in the slide, I, I spoke to 30 meter wetland buffer. That's actually what the Conservation Authority seeks unless uh, we can demonstrate there's no hydrological impact in the NHE. Uh, the, the minimum buffers that have generally been applied is 15 meters to the wetlands. And there are some wetlands uh, where the buffer is slightly less. And we've been, again, very transparent. And there's a section uh, in the NHE that talks about encroachment into the natural heritage buffers. And it doesn't mention it in the NHE, but I'm going to mention it anyway, that some of the buffers are a lot greater than 15 meters. It just happens where the wetlands are. Uh, it's a long way from the development limit. Uh, so, you know, we didn't make a big song and dance about that, but that, that is also a matter of fact. Uh, so the Conservation Authority regulate wetlands and they have to be satisfied that the buffers are appropriate. And that's, that process will certainly be uh, followed in this case. Um, I, I know there was talk about the wildlife Buff, you know, these buffers of 10 meters to the drip line being insufficient for wildlife. Um, I've done a lot of work on buffers. I've wrote a discussion paper for conservation authorities on buffers. And I've written a lot about um, area sensitive forest birds as a wildlife indicator in urban areas, uh, which was published by Environment Canada. And I, I, I can share with everybody, there is a problem with a, a thinking that we can have a lot of wildlife uh, in an area that's surrounded by urban development 
if we make the buffer 30, 40 or 50 meters. And I, in fact, this came up a long time ago in uh, Aurora 2B at an uh, Ontario Municipal Board hearing. Um, and the, the, the challenge is that the birds and the wildlife, they generally don't react to the buffer, they react to the general landscape which in this case is going to be urban. And so regardless of what the buffer is, the presence of species that are not urban tolerant is not gonna be maintained in an urban system. In other words, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exaggerate a little bit here to try and get the point across, but we can't expect you know, breeding um, black bears in an urban valley system. And the, the majority of area sensitive forest birds, for example, are missing from the Don Valley. Uh, even though the Don Valley is pretty extensive, it's big, the majority of birds that might be expected there are simply not there because of the urban stresses. And whether there's a 10 meter or a 20 meter or a 30 meter buffer, it doesn't make a difference. The scientific literature shows that the matrix, in other words, the surrounding landscape is really what controls the use of these areas. So when we go into an urban valley land, uh, it simply doesn't support the species that the same valley land would outside of the urban area. And you might say, well, that's because the buffers are inappropriate. It's not, it's because there's all kinds of effects that the buffers won't be able to mitigate. So it's a really important scientific um, issue and and i would direct anyone who's interested in it to the nhe on page 41 where it talks about woodland buffers and uh in fact it cites the ecological buffer guideline review uh that beacon prepared in uh, 2012 where there was a uh, a review of all the core literature around uh the provision of buffers it, it is a difficult um concept to wrap our minds around because uh, I think generally speaking, we tend to try and think that if the buffer was twice as big, it would be better, but the actual habitat doesn't change in size. It's still the same size. It doesn't matter what the buffer is. And so uh, the wildlife are responding to the fact that it's surrounded by roads, it's surrounded by urban infrastructure. And um, basically, uh, the two things are not very compatible. Uh, we're going to lose wildlife species as an area uh, um, urbanizes, and this bigger area is really quite urban. Uh, I made a note that I, uh, I had um, bats, buffers, bobolink, which uh, is, uh, I've got to figure out where that um, appendix record came from, and barn swallow to speak to. Is that, have I missed anything out? I that is all I have for you. But I think I'm going to move over to Mr. Givens now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Mr. Givens. Entrance block 110, north south to St. John's. There's a question that said uh, from one of them. Unmute. Yes, if you go to figure seven in the staff uh, report, uh, you will see block 110 is at the end of Street B. And it's the, it's the entrance that will be used by the school. I don't know where George got his information from, but it's very clearly labeled. So there is no north-south to St. John's from the school? No. No. No, this is uh, very clear on the, on the draft plan. Block 110 was created to create the entrance at the end of Street B uh, for access to the school. Okay. Previously, we've shown it as a lot. Okay. And then um, I believe George asked about the traffic study and did it, did it, um, I think there was more to it, but did it also look into the, the future application uh, in Newmarket as well? And did it, did it actually it, keep it, it, it did, Mr. Mayor? It did, certainly it did. But the, because the future lands in, uh, in Newmarket are still going to a major official plan amendment, we aren't comfortable with our knowledge to be able to do a final report. Uh, that we put the process that New Market is going through is that they will amend their official plan to remove the lands from the Oak Ridges Moraine designation that is, exists today, that is in their plan, not in the Oak Ridges Moraine plan. And then they will, once they have done that, 
they will then go through a secondary plan process. And through that secondary plan process, we will determine what the ultimate yield will be. So at the stage we were at when that transportation was, report was being prepared, we didn't have uh, total confidence in our numbers. We used the best information that was available with the understanding that at the secondary plan level, it'll all be freshened up when we know more about the, uh, the, the what the municipality will approve in new market. And the last one I got for you is page seven in regards to the multi-use path. And is there assurances well, that the, the Yes, we are, as I mentioned earlier, there are going to be conditions that are going to be imposed through the draft plan of subdivision to deal with the tree removal and, and replacement. There will also be conditions that deal with the uh, roadway uh, widening as well as the implementation of the sidewalk. The reason I said to the extent possible, and I hope that it's understood is that the deck for the bridge that exists today needs to be widened. And that in itself is not a small effort. Uh, so we aren't sure how much we can do within the existing platform um, and have a safe crossing. Um, we will be looking at all the options, including cantilevering a section of that on the north side so that we can create a safe platform. But ultimately it's a regional structure and the region has to be part of that discussion. Thank you. And that's all. Mr. Waters, do you have anything else? Uh, oh, Mr. Mayor, I think that covers it. Okay. Um, Council, before I... Well, I see we have two speakers uh, for another round. Um, before I go to them, uh, we, we are passed for, we are due for a health break. So I will, we will take a 10 minute health break as per our procedural bylaw.
Council will start back up with the public portion. I have Wendy Kenyon for a third time. Oh, fourth time, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Ms. Kenyon, if I could get you to state your name again and your address, and you have five minutes. Sure. Um, although I can't see myself. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. Um, sorry, bear with me. It's not my video. There we go. Here I am. Um, okay. C can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Wendy Kenyon. I've given my address to ta the town of Aurora already. And uh, I would like to start by ask, well, I, I guess I, I can't start by asking Mr. Henshaw, but I would refer to Appendix C of Beacon Environmental's Bre um, Natural Heritage Evaluation, which Mr. Henshaw signed. Um, which includes in it um, the uh, Bobo link. So I, I, I hope that Mr. Henshaw will be reassured that the Bobo link does, in fact, according to his own staff, um, live on that land. Um, at the June 8th meeting, I asked whether any studies had been done to assess the cumulative effect on wildlife, given that Shining Hill has multiple projects within one large area in Newmarket and Aurora. The planning director's response was, there's been a natural heritage evaluation report submitted by Beacon, and that has, has identified, from my understanding, no endangered habitat on the development block. However, Beacon didn't include an analysis of cumulative impacts on wildlife in its report. So I'm asking, would it be possible for the applicants for environmental firm Beacon to provide an answer to my original question about the cumulative impacts to wildlife? I'm sure the response would also be helpful to those examining the possibility of future trails, as well as the, nest of the next Shining Hill phases, including the new market proposal. Also respectfully, I'd like to point out that Mr. Waters' comment about endangered species is rather misleading. Potential endangered species habitat has already been identified on the property with further studies pending, i.e. A, a snag survey and acoustic survey. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Mr. Skoulakis, if I can get you to state your name your address and you have five minutes, sir. George, are you there? George, you're on mute. Oh, George, you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Go Sorry. ahead. Th thank you. Um, I've got a couple questions. Um, one, one of the questions I have is for uh, Mr. Hen Henshaw. He mentioned that the um, the horse shelter was very small. Does he have an indication of how large um, it is or it was? Uh, number one. Um, my second question is regarding the, the traffic study to Mr. Given. Uh, it's uh, thank you for that answer, but um, for for um, um, a traffic study that looks into future, um, you know, um, traffic volumes or tries to project future uh, traffic volumes. Uh, for 2023 and 2028, you have to take into account the phases, the future phases of Shining Hill, because they're very much in play. Not, not only that, but we already know that there's 3,500 lots. 3,500 lots. That that's approximately nine to ten thousand people. So if we even consider 
you know, 3,000 in more future developments um, in the new market area. Um, they're still, you know, that represents approximately 9,000 people, 8,000 people, whatever the number is. That represents a substantial amount of traffic. So when you're doing projections into the future, you, you, you have to take that into account. Whether it's, you know, the final number is 3,000 lots or 2,800 lots or 3,500 lots, you've got to put something down. The report, the, the, the traffic report does not. And... Um, my uh, other question is, would it be possible for uh, someone to put up the development uh, concept uh, map that identifies all the lots? Because, you know, on this map here, it, it definitely shows that block 110 is the road widening and the uh, entrance to uh, St. Saint, Saint Anne's is definitely not block 110. I'm not quite sure um, what Mr. Given is talking about in terms of blocks. I, I know that lot number 53 was removed in order to accommodate that entrance. But, you know, in his, I, I didn't quite follow his explanation because I, I I'm not sure if, um, you know, uh, he mentioned figure seven, but basically the development plan with all the, the lots and all the blocks, the latest one, the one that was uh, Rosanna used for her presentation today. So that's page six. If, if you can, you know, uh, look at that, you'll see the block 110 refers to road widening. So I just need some clarity on that. Thank you. Thank you. Zintra, if I could get you to say your name again and your address, and you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, Zintra Schlotter, resident of Aurora, St. Andrews on the Hill. Um, just uh, further to um, the um, uh, communication of the road that's proposed to, to uh, a residential road that is to link Newmarket and Aurora. In the 30 years that we've lived in Aurora, the town has more than doubled in size. It was 25,000 people as a population in 1991. So there's been an, uh, a large uh, growth, which is to be expected. Um, along St. John Side Road in particular, um, there's been a lot of development east of Bayview, um, and that's uh, of the recent past. Um, but if the councillors will make note that nowhere between that, to the best of my knowledge, nowhere between the town of Newmarket and Aurora is there a residential street that communicates between the two towns. They're all regional roads that are north-south roads. So Bathurst, Young Street, Bayview, Leslie. Um, those are the roads that join the towns, and I would think that they're under regional um, uh, budgeting for maintenance, et cetera. Why is it that we're looking at proposing a subdivision, a residential road that is going to run through the two towns? Who's going to be responsible for maintaining? And as um, uh, George just pointed out, uh, it is going to bring a, a huge number of people down into St. John's Side Road, which is an Aurora road that has to be uh, included in the budget on, uh, for widening or maintenance in general. So again, no other subdivision uh, in the past has linked a residential road um, between Newmarket and Aurora causing these issues and increase of traffic. They've always gone to the major regional road. So I would propose that council seriously looks at not having I realize there's a buffer zone, buffers can, can be removed, uh, or the three meter zone rather, but seriously to look and consider why is the road being communicating between two towns? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henshaw, cumulative effect of wildlife. Is that looked at? Thank you. Um if Mr. Mayor, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to just go back to the bottle link. Um, uh, I'd like to apologize to Ms. Kenyon. Um, she has spotted an omission in our report 
And I've got to the bottom of it thanks to the marvels of modern technology where I can go to the field data. Uh, there was indeed a single bobolink recorded 200 meters west of the school uh, of the of the Dunning house, I should say, uh, flying over the forest. And so that's not breeding habitat. So it, I, I think it's fair to say we should have um, uh, nailed that down in the report so that it, it does say in two places we had a bobolink, but in the breeding table, it says that there were no breeding bobolink. And I think we need to explain that. So in a future edition, uh, we will um, make that very clear uh, as to where that was over the forest. Uh, and that area where the bobolink was over the forest is all protected. Uh, so I, I hopefully um, that explains um, the, uh, the misunderstanding uh, that's developed around that. So I do apologize uh, to Ms. Kenyon. She was totally right. There's two places where we say there was a bobolink and there's one place where we say there was no breeding bobolinks. And, and the two statements sound like they're in conflict, but they're not. And there needs to be an explanation. So we will provide that. Um, I'm going to uh, have a, a clumsy attempt at cumulative effects. We do that quite a lot for uh, federal environmental assessments. We don't do it very often for uh, single applications because the, we're asked uh, through the Planning Act process to apply the PPS um, to the subject property, uh, not to properties beyond. And so there is a bit of a planning answer to that question. Uh, I, I will attempt to answer it from an ecolo uh, ecological point of view, and then I'll invite Don to um, address the planning aspect of it. Um, the, the, the challenge with um, cumulative effects is always, what is the appropriate scale? Uh, because it really shouldn't go with ownership, it should go with the landscape. And so cumulative effects might be looked at at the level of the town, uh, for example, uh, or you know even a bigger area. And so the, the reason we generally don't do it is because we'd be guessing as to what's going to happen in the future in many other places. It's really complex um, challenge to look at cumulative effects, which is basically what is the effect of doing a, a, a multiple development projects over a long period of time uh, collectively. Very, very challenging. If the question is, why can't these effects be looked at in conjunction with all of the different phases of um, this particular project? Well, that's really not a cumulative effects exercise in the true scientific sense of the word. It's really saying, let's put the two projects together and, lo and look at the mitigation and effects um, as one whole, like, you know, the new market project along with the Aurora project. And I think that raises some planning questions more than anything. I can do it ecologically because we would just continue with our process of identifying the natural heritage system on the new market lands and looking at what the appropriate buffers would be in, in the bigger picture. So we, we could do that, um, but we're not asked to do that by the process. The process asks, asks us to look at the effects on the subject property. Uh, but it, it, if the subject property happened to be all of the lands owned by the proponent, uh, it, we, we would simply proceed and do that as one report. Thank you, Mr. Henshaw. Mr. Gibbons, did you have anything to add to that? I'll get you yes, the... Um... The approach that we've taken is comprehensive. That's why we've, we've seen us uh, show you the total um, uh, plan for the new market and the Aurora side of things. Uh, and uh, it, it will be done comprehensively as we move through the balance of the lands in new market. We've submitted to new market a full set of policy requirements to put into their official plan that will include what Mr. Henshaw has just described to make sure that we have the full picture completed. But until we're working with New Market, uh, we don't have um, the, you know, the, um, their support yet to proceed with that. Uh, this is a discussion that we are having still. Uh, we think we are um, going down the correct path, but uh, that, that um, policy and framework that we submitted to them 
was just sent in about two weeks ago, or a week ago, I guess it was. So it's fresh and we are moving forward with that. With respect to um, a couple of things, I know George asked a question again about Block 110. I refer him again to Figure 7, which is the revised draft plan. I think he may be looking at the old draft plan. And very clearly, the access into St. John's or St. Anne's is Block 110. Thank you, Stevens. And I think that there was one more, and I, I, I must have missed it. That all I have written down is how large is it? And I have to apologize. I... Oh, this would be the population to the north, I believe, is what uh, George was talking about. That wasn't, we did provide to uh, Dylan, who did the consulting or the transportation work, uh, uh, an estimate of what we thought it might uh, accommodate. And we did that using the uh, population uh, factors that the region has in their official plan of 50 persons and jobs to the hectare, which um, is a, uh, an indication of what the region expects on greenfield development. Uh, so we said, let's start with that until we get further into this as a basis for trying to quantify the scale of the traffic that would be generated. Thank you. Go around for a fifth time. Wendy Kenyon. Ms. Kenyon, if I can get you to state your name and your address, you have five minutes. Uh, Wendy Kenyon, resident of Aurora. Um, Mr. Henshaw, I thank you and I appreciate the fact that uh, you acknowledge that um, there was some, um, I don't know what to call it really, but I'm looking at your natural heritage evaluation that you signed. It's Appendix C, the breeding bird list. And we have uh, a breeding pair of Bobo Link on the property. So you're saying that you apologize, but they were just flying over, but that's not what your report says. That's not what your person said who was doing the survey and that you subsequently signed. So I have a real problem with this. Um, it, it, it's just not right. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to see the bigger picture. I'm trying to keep an open mind, but um, I, I do see that, uh, for example, um, the, the document, um, how much habitat is enough, which has finally found its way into the official plan review, um, is co-authored, uh, the latest edition, by a Brian Henshaw. And I wonder whether it's the Brian Henshaw of <laughs> Beacon Environmental. Um, it, it, just, it, it just doesn't sit right with me. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to keep an open mind, um, but seeing that there was a Bobo link linked in the Beacon Environmental Report, and now Mr. Henshaw is saying that it was just a, a passing by of birds flying over. It just doesn't sit right. Um, I'm sorry, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuskulakis, I get you to state your name and your address, and you have five minutes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Henshaw did not, did not answer my question, and my question was how small or how large was the horse shelter that was removed? Um, I, I still don't know um, the, you know, the block 110. It's, it's not that important. Maybe uh, what I'm looking at is the map that was provided uh, in the staff report and, you know, the development concept. So um, regardless, you know, if it's a typo in the covering letter, whatever the case may be, that's not that important. That's fine. But I do have one follow-up question uh, also for uh, Mr. Henshaw, and I would appreciate if you could uh, explain the species area relationship um, concept. Uh, I would appreciate that. 
And um, that's my final questions. Um, with the exception of when I do get an answer on the horse shelter, uh, I will have one more follow-up question and, and then I'll leave everybody alone. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Henshaw, how large or small is the horse shelter that was removed? Hello again. Um, I can see it on the air photo and I can remember it in the field, but I don't know the exact size of it. Um, I think it's approximately 10 meters long by three meters wide. Uh, and I would guess that it was about two meters tall. And it was a three-sided uh, a three-sided structure with a roof uh, a roof on it. Okay, and can you speak to the species area relationship? Yes, and uh, I, I, it gives me an opportunity to try and give Miss Kenyon a little more comfort um, about uh, the bobolink record. Um, there are bobolinks breeding in the new market lands, and it doesn't surprise me that we'd have one flying over here because the new market lands are not very far away. Uh, obviously, they're a meter away <laughs> uh, when you get to the property line. So further to the north, uh, we, we did record bobolinks breeding. Um, and what's happened here is the one bobolink flying over was put down as one bobolink flying over. And it should have simply said in the appendix, fly over. That, that's what's missing. Uh, and we should have mentioned it in the text. But where it was recorded was in the woodland, over the woodlands, uh, about 200 meters west of the school. And or the proposed school, I should say. And uh, that's not suitable habitat for nesting bobolink because they only nest in fields. And um, the area species relationship is generally, the smaller the area, the fewer species you can expect uh, to occur there. And you know, when we remove any kind of habitat, uh, then there's gonna be fewer nesting species because even on the house itself, on the Dunning house, there's probably three or four nesting species and one of them is a threatened or endangered species, chimney swift. Uh, in a car park, you may have three or four nesting species. On a building, there's you know American robins, there's a uh, number of species that nest. And all I'm doing is demonstrating, I hope that birds nest everywhere and this habitat for people is also habitat for wildlife. I'm sure we've all had them in our house, sometimes unwelcome guests, perhaps, but uh, they occur everywhere. And so when you convert uh, agricultural fields to uh, urban um, development, there's going to be a loss of species that will use those agricultural fields. There's no question about that. And we mention it in our NHE. Uh, the, the, the difference is, or really the point is, that at some point, some of those attributes or some of those things that we have on a site are being determined by society in general to be more important, whether they be significant woodlands or habitat for um, regulated species or hazard lands or other kinds of features. And so we're not asked to say, we've got to protect all habitat. We're asked to say which habitat is, in, is sufficiently important that it should be protected. And, and that's a big difference. And so, uh, it's true that when you reduce the area of agricultural lands, you're going to lose species that occupy agricultural lands. But it, we've determined uh, that the, it, those species are maybe less important than other species. There is an exception here, and that's bobolink and meadowlark. Uh, we have those species north of this subject property, but we don't have them nesting on the subject property. Uh, although we did have barn swallow and we do have chimney swift and there are butternut trees. So it's true, it's a true statement that there are a number of threatened and endangered species on the subject property. They all have to be dealt with in accordance with the Endangered Species Act before any habitat is removed. Um, and the same thing will happen on the new market lands. They all have to be uh, dealt with in accordance with the Endangered Species Act before the habitat is changed. Uh, I hope that answers um, uh, the question um, that I, as, I, as I think it was posed. 
Thank you, Mr. Anshaw. Ms. Kenyon, sixth time. Thank you. you. State your name and your address, and you have five minutes. Uh, Wendy Kenyon, address already given. Mr. Henshaw, this habitat was legally protected. It was an, a threatened species barn swallow nest that was removed. And Beacon had seen it. And 10 days later, it was removed. So I'm asking you tonight, why was it removed? Why did Beacon not protect it? Because no one's answered that yet. And that's really important, really important. I I'm sorry, but I feel that everything that is being said tonight is just an excuse for what's really going on, which is that no one really cares. No one really cares that a barn swallow nest was removed during an active season when the nest was still viable and the parents were still there. No one really cares, but you should care because you're promoting yourselves. Beacon, Shining Hill, Schaefer's, Malone Given Parsons, you're, you're all participating in the Lake Simcoe Foundation dinner this year as promoters, uh, as, as guardians of Lake Simcoe, but you're not. I'm sorry, but the amount of work and effort that residents have had to put into looking at and, and, and trying to get the reports and um, analyzing and examining and questioning all the information that's being put forward, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have to do that as residents, um, but we have, um, and I think it's necessary because clearly something's really wrong. I don't live next to the Shining Hill lands. I didn't live next to the Henderson lands, but I care. I care about the wildlife in this town. And from what I'm seeing, we're not doing them as a service here. The town isn't doing them a service. So I would ask, please, tonight, councillors, when you have your discussions later on, listen, please listen to what's been said by residents tonight, because you've had the information, you've had time to check the facts. What you're, what you're hearing and what you're seeing are two totally different things. And we need to protect our wildlife. We need to protect these last few remaining areas. Please do something about this. Help us, please. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Mr. Kuskuliakis, if I can get you to state your name and your address, and you have five minutes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, George Skulikas, uh, Aurora resident. Um, I, the, the answer was, or the, my internet was cutting in and out. So um, I think I heard Mr. Hensaw say that the, the horse shelter uh, size was three meters by 10 meters. Is, is, can someone verify that please? Yeah, I think he's, he, yes, you're correct. He, he said he believes that it was the size. He, he's not hundred percent sure, but he believes that that was roughly the approximate size. Oh, yeah, thank you. Re regarding 10, 10, 10 by, uh, sorry, um, that's uh, 10, 10 by uh, 3 by 10 meters, that's 30 meters, that's approximately two, three, uh, 275 square feet, and, and yet I've received information from the planning uh, department indicating that the horse shelter did not require a demolition permit because it was less than 100 square feet. So can someone from the planning department please verify or, or clarify that um, that's what they told me and also because I have it in writing anyway, but uh, also the fact that there was no demolition permit when one is required uh, for anything over hundred square feet. Thank you. Thank you, George. Mr. Waters. 
Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, my understanding and speaking to the chief building official was that a, a demolition permit was not issued for the shelter. Was not one, was one not applied for, and one was not issued. Was sorry, one was applied for, but it was not issued. Sorry, one was not applied for. Okay. Any other comments from the public? Mr. Schulakis, I, 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 I am going to just remind you, uh, please, can you keep it to questions and comments? Uh, we, we are actually not supposed to be debating with the public, but go ahead, George. Yeah, I still didn't get a reason why not, because it's, it's more than uh, 100 square feet. Well, and, and George, I'll just answer that quickly. Uh, from what the applicant mentioned, Mr. Henshaw said, is that he, he's not oh, sure of the size, and he just gave an approximate of what he believed. Well, approximate, but if, it, if it's three times the size, it's not like 125 feet, it's 300. That, that's, that's a big difference. And by the way, just so you know, I, I used figure four of the Beacon Environmental Report, and I did my own calculations because the figure four has a lead uh, scale, and I came up with uh, um, I came up with uh, 275 square feet. So I was very close on on, on that uh, approximation. But regardless, if it's three times the size, and you know you require a um, uh, a building a demolition permit to to remove that structure. Um, you know, I, I like to know why. And in fact, why would the town actually tell me that the horse shelter was less than a hundred, and therefore uh, a permit was not required? Again, this is this gets back to the questionable uh, comments and and you know untruths. Thank you. Thank you, George. Mr. Waters, can we get that information and make that available for Mr. Skouliakis at some point? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Is there any other comments from the members of the public? Going once, going twice, three times. Ms. Council, I will close public portion of this meeting. We have a recommendation in front of us that report number PDS 21-099 be received Two, that the comments provided at the public planning meeting be addressed by planning and development services in a report to a future general committee meeting. Would anyone like to move that recommendation? Councilor Thompson, seconded by Councilor Gilliland. Comments, questions to the applicant or to the report? Seeing none, just gotta hit your button. I, I know it's been a while actually, Councilor Gardner, so just hit that, hit that button. No, no, right beside your mic. You don't hit it to speak anymore. You just hit it to, and your name pops up, remember? <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> Councilor Gardner, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the first question is to, um, guess Mr. Gibbon. If uh, the developer constructs a multi-use path within the roadway, um, which may not happen, or a parallel off street to St. John's, um, do you know how many more trees would need to be removed? Mr. Gibbon? I can't tell you now, but I can get back to you because we do have a tree inventory. Um, yeah. So I can get back to you with that information. Councilor? Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, there were 2,080 trees that were recorded and assessed um, over a certain DBH. It says in the report, or in perhaps your comments, due to the grading for the development, um, very few trees can be retained. I'm not sure I, I'm using the word very few, perhaps a third are you talking about? Mr. Kevin? 
Uh, I haven't done a count, but we are aware that not only do we have to remove the trees to put the path in, we have to grade the land as well, which um, is important to achieve the kind of grades that are suitable for a walking path. So I, I will get back to you, Councilor Gardner, to, to let you know how many trees it is. Thank you. I, I'm just going to read my notes. Um, sure. uh, due to the grading for the development, a few trees can be retained. Uh, with respect to the last report, it was talking about 1,500 trees would need to be removed. This report is approximately 1,300. Mr. Gavin? Yes, we went back and looked in more detail at the tree inventory and the plan of subdivision to understand how many trees were actually impacted. Uh, so what I've provided you with now is a more precise number. Councilor? Thank you. Do you expect that will change? Mr. Gavin? Uh, I don't think it will change. We spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure we had it right. Councilor? Thank you. Um, so if you look at the number of trees that are going to be retained versus destroyed, uh, about 65% of the trees will need to be removed. Uh, that's just a comment. Um, it was 72% with the almost 1,500 trees. Now it's down to 60 to 65%. Um, Let me make sure I'm saying that correctly. So we're, we're doing less, obviously that's better. It was about 75%, now maybe you're down to 65%. So that's a good that's a good thing. The bad thing is that's a lot of trees that have to be removed. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you are going to plant uh, a lot of trees to, you know, well over 2,000 trees. But do you have an idea what, what size those trees are going to be? And can you assure council that they will be of a certain size? We don't want saplings because they'll just take too long to enhance our tree canopy. Mr. Gavin? That'll all become part of the... Um, compensation plan that we get approved through the plan of subdivision process uh, as a condition of uh, being able to remove the trees. Um, I can't tell you now what the size or caliper of the trees will be, but in my experience in working with the, uh, these um, plantation replacements or, or tree replacements as necessary, is that the younger trees are more resilient and take hold more quickly uh, than the larger ones do. And they often pass the larger ones in terms of growth height and, and size and girth um, very quickly. So it's it's not as simple as just plant bigger ones and that they will take, you know, they will fill the gap. The smaller ones that you plant are more resilient and grow faster. Council. Thank you. Um, and I'm not going to disagree with you, but they certainly need to be of a certain size when they're planted. I mean, I'm not talking about saplings that are gonna blow around in the wind. I'm talking about something a little more substantial, young, but a little more substantial. Um, you say that, or the report says the proposal includes 56% of the land area for environmental protection. Are you including the York Region Forest in this? Mr. Given? In this protected land? I'm only including the lands that are within the ownership of my client. Thank you. Councilor? Uh, I guess this one's for Mr. Henshaw. Hello, Councillor. Hi, thank you. Councillor, if I may, um, uh, the answer to your previous question is actually in the um, Arborist Report on page 10, where it stipulates what the size of the replacement stock should be. Thank you. Councillor. 
So when, when you're looking at wildlife, um, including at risk, do you, um, do you look at existing conditions and how sensitive these species are to development? Um, and uh, what's also going around on in the adjacent developments? Mr. Henshaw? Um, I'm gonna answer the question uh, on the basis of the regulated species under the Endangered Species Act. I think that's, I think that's what, um, Councillor, is that what you're talking about? Councillor? Um, I'm just trying to find out how, how you, you know, in the protection of what exists, um, well, especially with what's adjacent to the area, do, do you look at that and see um, how that might affect the, uh, the species and the wildlife? Should we uh, be moving the buffers around and putting homes, you know, in the area? Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I uh, then I think I'll answer it two ways because the uh, forgive me for sounding obtuse, but the Endangered Species Act is a very prescriptive process, and so with respect to species that are regulated, um, like bobolink, uh, barn swallow, uh, meadowlark. The and these are all species that are within this uh, general area. Um, uh, we have to follow um, what the MECP requires. Uh, I, I, and I know there was an unfortunate incident with the horse shed, but that aside for a minute, um, the, there is a requirement to satisfy the Endangered Species Act and that's done through the regulator. And um, like I said earlier, that has to be relatively real time uh, because species come and go. And um, we have to address uh, the bobolinks wherever they are, and we have to address uh, the butternut trees. And the province, in its wisdom, has provided various mechanisms to deal with those species. Sometimes they have to be protected in situ. Um, sometimes uh, the province has put in a place, a system, to deal with individual nests like barn swallow. It's an online system. You build a structure uh, somewhere else uh, within a kilometer and you don't have to go through a permit process. Uh, or sometimes you have to go through a full on what's called an overall benefit process or permit um, to provide uh, a, a net benefit to the species when you remove some of its habitat. So for those species, whether they be bats, birds, plants, trees that are regulated, we have to go through that process. It's legislated and it's a, uh, a you know, it's a very important piece of legislation. Um, for everything else, so, sorry, councillor. No, go ahead, thank you. For everything else that's not regulated, um, th there's a requirement to identify what's important um, and it's not up to me to decide what's important, um, although I interpret the language of the policies. Um, it's up to uh, society at large, whether the wetland is significant, whether the woodland is significant, uh, that's capital S significant. And those things have to be protected. And the things that are determined not to be as important, that they warrant protection when trying to balance uh, good planning and growth management with the protection of natural resources in a serviced urban area. It's a challenge, um, but some things are going to be there, but determined not to be sufficiently important that they should be protected for the long term. Uh, and so we, we do have two classes of uh, attributes, if you will, those that we deem collectively, I mean, not we beacon, but collectively society says, these are so important that they need to stay and they need to be protected versus those that, um, uh, well, to put it bluntly, can be removed while land development proceeds. Council. And a council, ha and a council of the day has to agree with that? Uh, no, ma'am, I, I don't think um, it's a question of agreement. It's really a question of, making sure, I think, that um, the proponents, consultants, 
have done the proper job according to the rules of the day, uh, rather than agreeing with the value statement about what's important and what isn't. The province has set forth uh, through the PPS um, uh, the, the, the rules of the game, if you will, about what the province considers to be sufficiently important that it should be protected. Sometimes um, there are additional regulations. So for example, uh, with wetlands, the province has said provincially significant wetlands need to be protected. But if it's not a provincially significant wetland, then the next level of um, satisfaction, if you will, lies with the conservation authority who regulate all wetlands. Uh, and so I, I think it's uh, a little more than um, applying one's value judgment. It's more about uh, what are the rules and policies and regulations of the day? Uh, does that answer your question, ma'am? Councillor? Thank you. Um, there is um, a wetland on the property that is man-made, and it's not provincially significant. However, it is significant to the Lake Simcoe Authority because it's in their mapping. And, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead. Continue. And this this um, this area is going to be filled in for six homes. And the authority says that there has to be another area provided. There has to be compensation, not money, but compensation for this wetland. Do you have anything to say about that? Councillor, and I'm gonna that's gonna be your last question for this round because I'm, I, I gave you an extra 30 seconds because there was a bit of a pause. So, Mr. Henshaw. Did you uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, I, I, I don't know uh, that the Conservation Authority has used the word significant because we're always pretty reluctant to use that word unless we're referring to um, a provincially significant wetland. But there's no doubt that there's wetland there. We, we documented it. Uh, no, I don't think anybody knew it was there until we, we did document it. Um, uh, it and, and I'm not going to call it man-made because it could have been a woman that made it. But whoever it was, um, it was we, we looked through historical aerial photographs and found that the, 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 when the road was constructed, the material from the road to the Dunning House was piled up in a berm-like fashion and it blocked off the drainage that was overland that used to go across the road. And it's a very dry wetland. There's no standing water in it, for example. Uh, so a wetland in Ontario is determined by the species of plants there. And if they're 50% wetland plants, then we call it a wetland, even if there's no water there. And, and this is a dry, one of the drier wetland types. Um, and so far, uh, we've suggested that because this wetland is, um, was created, that it really shouldn't trigger compensation uh, under the, under the uh, uh, LSRCA guidelines. And that conversation still has to be completed with uh, Lake Simcoe. And I'm certain that because they regulate all wetlands constructed or not, artificial or not, um, uh, that will have to be resolved to the satisfaction of both the conservation authority um, and the town before uh, the wetland can be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, could I just ask you, is this five minutes just to, I'm not addressing the report, I'm addressing Oh, it's five minutes to the applicant and to the report. I get, I'll get 10 minutes in total to address this whole shebang. I think for an, uh, I think that's, um, I would like to make a motion that uh, we allow more speaking time as this is such a significant um, application. So you'd like to waive procedure or bylaw to allow for more speaking time? Or seconder, Councillor Gallo. Any two thirds? All those in favor? Yeah, no, of course. I'm. I'm not going to continue, but I think ten minutes in total for each one of us to try and address the. We, we spent I don't know how long, more than two hours on residents' comments. 
Well, it is public planning and it's more for the public. I understand, but I think we need, we need more time to address them. Well, sure. If council wishes to have more speaking time, that's up to council as a whole. Okay, so um, I'm going to propose an extra 10 minutes. Why don't we go around this council I mentioned, and then if we feel we need more time, then we can deal with it at that time. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Gallo. Thank you. Um, first off, I think it'd be remiss if, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge uh, the work of uh, the volunteers and the speakers from the public uh, tonight and on previous occasions. Um, there, there are days when I feel quite uh, depressed and I feel like I'm spinning my wheels at this table, but um, tonight I feel quite rejuvenated. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's thanks to the residents that came up and uh, spoke, took their time to analyze the application, to communicate to us uh, their issues. Uh, and I want you all to know that I definitely uh, appreciate it. I share your concerns um, almost on a weekly basis, unfortunately. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, you've, um, your questions um, were genuine and well thought out and researched. Um, uh, so, and a lot of them I had and, and thankfully you answered so, so I won't waste uh, any, any more time. So thanks a lot. I don't see you, but uh, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I did want to go back to uh, one of the questions that George um, had proposed because it kind of it's a starting point for me, and that has to do with, um, uh, and this is through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Mr. Waters, uh, what triggers a complete application? Because to me, that is such a significant point in time because it, it starts the clock ticking, as we know. Uh, and then developer has 120 days and, and off we go and then they can, they can challenge it. So I'm, 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 I'd love to hear uh, a rational, uh, or at least are there triggers that staff use in order to determine a complete application? Do you, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Waters? Okay, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so through the pre-com process, um, we identify uh, the component studies that are necessary to support a, a planning application. Um, and um, they, the pre-consultation process does include um, our, um, our partners external to the town, like the region, like the Conservation Authority, and other public agencies um, that are part of the planning review process. Um, so typically those are identified. Um, and then the applicant is then responsible for submitting those studies. Um, and depending on the type of application, there could be 15 or 20 studies, or it could be one study. And those are submitted to the town. Um, we review them, not so much for um, the content, but to make sure that it is a complete application that they have su submitted the study. Uh, and then what, if they have submitted all the required studies as per the pre-con, then it's, then it's declared a complete application. And then the um, time starts ticking. Councilor? And, and is this a process that we're establishing or is, is, are the guidelines in, in the, the, the act or, or, I mean, can we be more thorough and request more time and, and, and dig deeper and get a lot of these answers, all these questions answered before we say it's a complete application? And, and I think you all know where I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting at. It would have been nice to have ha had many of these questions answered or or input from the various agencies uh, to a degree that we're satisfied before we can say we have a complete application. Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that's not how the process works. Um, so in our official plan, we have a list of component studies and the list is as long as your arm. Um, they cover traffic, environment, um, they cover an uh, urban design, and there's a whole list of them. Um, once an application is made um, with, with the component studies, we have 30 days to respond. That's according to the Planning Act. So we take 30 days, we review them, um, and if we feel that you know, they satisfy the pre-cons, 
application in terms of the list of studies, then we declare it a complete application and then we circulate it. Council? Okay, I mean, to me, it, it, it just, it's just logical that we that it would be great for us if we could spend a little more time on that part before suggesting it's a complete application or, or identifying as a complete application so that we, you know, we don't get that time, that, that clock ticking as early as it, I, I feel like it is many times. Um, can I just get confirmation because I heard both sides of, from a the traffic study, whether or not um, the lands to the north in New Market were taken into account um, in the traffic study. The 3,000, 3,500 homes, roughly, uh, you know, five, 6,000 people. Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. What I heard <clears throat> Mr. Given respond is that it's difficult to sort of estimate the number of units now because those lands to the north are in the planning process. So you had a, a very rough estimation in terms of the background traffic that would be generated from that development. Um, as, as I said before, uh, this Aurora development does not hinge or depend on the new market lands. It's being the planned as per servicing um, the, uh, the Aurora lands, uh, including the school and the residential development as well. Council? Um, and, and I heard that, and, and, and I guess to me, an alarm bell rang because we can't ignore what's happening to the north of us, especially in terms of traffic and roadways. I mean, uh, unless we're going to say if it doesn't happen, we're going to shut that road off and nothing's going to happen north of, of our uh, northern boundary. Um, and if that's the case, that roadway doesn't comply and, and it has to be reconfigured anyway. So it doesn't make sense to me that we're saying we're only dealing with Aurora, yet that road goes north into Newmarket unless we were super confident that that application is going to be going through. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait until see, to see what new market does before we can ever move forward with this application. How can we deal with just Aurora and that roadway goes into new market and they haven't made any decisions yet? To you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Waters. For you, Mr. Mayor, I'll try to answer this question. And if um, maybe I can rely on Don Givens consult, traffic consultant to explain. Um, there are no planning approvals issued to the north. There are no approvals at all for residential. In fact, it's, as you heard tonight, um, it has no development rights. It's basically agricultural land. Um, so, you know, it's a what if scenario. It's, it's sort of testing, uh, doing a sensitivity test on um, what could potentially happen uh, downstream at this intersection. Um, and I'll ask Mr. Given if he could just expand on the consultant's work in terms of that, uh, transportation study. Thank you. Mr. Gavin. Happy to speak to this. Um, I did try to explain that the best we could do at the time, we uh, were advising the, tra the traffic consultant was to say the we know how much developable land there is uh, once we take out the natural heritage features and we apply the region's density of 50 persons and jobs to the hectare, which was also a growth plan density uh, that the, provin the province used. And that was the guide that we gave him to work with uh, so that he could come up with a better understanding of what the ultimate uh, range of uh, um, population could be. Councillor? Thank you, and I, I understood that, and that's not necessarily my, my issue. My issue is that roadway going into a, a new market that doesn't have any... any uh, Town of Newmarket hasn't approved anything, and, and how do we address it if they don't? Um, we'll leave that one aside. I have Councillor, I'll just, I'll just, left. just to answer that, I'll just add what um, what was said during um, the conversations and the question is being answered. Uh, there, th this would basically be a dead end road, and there'd be a three meter reserve, and that reserve wouldn't be lifted unless the town of Aurora accepted any solutions or or anything moving forward to lift that three meter reserve from opening up. So it would just be a dead end road. Okay. Um, on, and I don't know if I have enough time. Okay. Oh. Ask your last question. Go ahead. Uh, on, on page uh, 13 of the report, in, in the comments section, York Region, um, it speaks to uh, the MCR process that isn't complete. And as a result, 
uh, it says, in light of the above, the MCR are not being repeated. York Region hasn't, hasn't adopted their, their latest regional plan. York Region suggests uh, the option of splitting consideration of the applications so that the lands currently within the urban area of the York Region official plan can be considered now by the town and York Region. Uh, with consideration of the lands outside of the urban area, waiting until the approval of the ROP. Um, can someone explain that to me? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that these lands, some portion, a portion of these lands are outside the White Belt, or in the White Belt, rather, excuse me, outside the, the regional urban boundary. However, they're within the town of Aurora urban boundary. So what I understand um, is that there was a mapping error as part of the previous regional official plan, and a portion of these lands were left out. Um, we have had discussions with um, the region and they recognize it as, as a um, mapping error and that it, it doesn't really hinge on their um, current MCR in terms of the growth forecast, the allocations of the other municipalities. So they're gonna deal with it as part of a mapping uh, change as they bring forward their uh, regional plan. So. As far as we're concerned, you know, there, you know, it is, a, is it, it, it's, it is a housekeeping matter to be dealt with, and but that doesn't prevent the application from being moved, from moving forward. It's just we have to wait for them to undertake the mapping exercise. I'll continue on my next round, but yeah, okay. I'd, like, I'd like more on that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Gillen. Thank you. Uh, question to uh, Mr. Waters, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Waters. I um, mean, in, in respect to the tree assessment, can you define the definition of native that was in the report? Mr. Waters, through you, um, Mr. Mayor, I believe that the majority of the trees on the subject lands that are in the development block um, or proposed for development are so called plantation trees that they were planted uh, by the owner. Um, they are native to Ontario, but my understanding is they were planted by the owner, um, which I think is why it's called plantation. Councilor? Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, I guess one of the, I guess, positive things is we do have a, a revised tree compensation policy that does have strength. And uh, Mr. Gibbons, you'll know that as council, we did ensure that we wanted to increase the DBH of trees that were planted that were not saplings and that we do understand that, um, you know, obviously planting a rather mature tree is not going to have the best um, rate of survival, but certainly by increasing the age by three, four or five really makes a huge impact on the carbon capture and can successfully root um, quite easily. And in doing so, diversifying that and considering the carbon capture is something that is included in that and we really do hope to expect that that detail has been taken consideration because it is their policy. That's why we revised the policy and that's why it's in place. Um, I did don't notice that there was some stuff on there in regards to ash and Manitoba maples. So I guess it is a positive in the sense that those would be ones that we would want to have replaced anyway. I am happy to hear that it has been reduced as a Councillor Gartner's point from 75 to 65. Um, but again, until we get all these reports back, we're obviously not going to be satisfied. So I guess in saying that, um, it's great that we're having this public planning meeting because it's giving public an opportunity to speak and to iron out what all these issues are. Yes, I'd like to see more of these reports. Everybody around council wants to see these reports. And I think so the public does as well. Um, so in saying that, um, having this coming back to GC, are we going to be expected to have all these reports completed um, these issues, the studies, and everything before council sees this at GC3, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Waters. Mr. Waters, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's our intention that uh, we, if we get, if, if the recommendation is approved uh, as written, re report back to GC that we would um, answer as many of the questions that are outstanding at the moment from a technical perspective um, so that council has that information before they make a decision. And where there, we don't have information available on the technical side, that we have an appropriate draft plan condition to, ad to address it moving forward. Councillor? Thank you. So in, in moving forward, it's not a done deal. We have the opportunity to resist on some of the findings and the reports at that time. Correct? Mr. Waters? 
through you, sir. That's correct. Councillor? Great. Um, as far as the wetlands, um, I did read in uh, one of the comments that uh, although it's not necessary that the Lakes and Conservation Authority did ask for some ecological offsetting. So is that something to be expected? And, and maybe it's through Mr. Merritt and Mr. Givens, because I'm hearing two things to saying it's not necessary, but is this saying that they're asking for it or is this a requirement? I'm a little confused on that. Mr. Given. Yes, when the Lake Simcoe asks for something, we take it as being something that we is serious and, and uh, we try to accommodate it wherever we can. Um, there's no nothing to be gained by fighting with them. Councilor? Thank you. And, and I appreciate that. So I look forward to when the assessment's done that uh, we'll be looking for that ecological offsetting and, uh, and uh, looking over that report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, a couple of things. First of all, I do want to thank uh, the residents. Incredible research, passion, concern. Uh, and because of that, it helps us understand even more uh, things that we wouldn't necessarily pick out ourselves. Their expertise in this area would be, uh, I would be fooling myself if I could understand uh, the, the nature of, uh, of their strengths and skill sets. So I absolutely appreciate that. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one is there was a concern about the buffer, um, the 10 meter buffer on the Oak Ridge's I mean, there's a, a tip, no, sorry, a typical buffer is 10 meters. Is is that what we're sticking to? Or has the developer uh, no, you know, listening that we're looking a little bit, you know, to strengthen that? And can we go back and negotiate that a bit more? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. That's one of the things we have to resolve is okay. the width of the buffers. Uh, the developer is proposing a certain width. We need the feedback of the conservation authority, whether that's appropriate or whether they should be increased. Perfect. That's one of the things we have to resolve before coming back to GC. Excellent. Council? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's good. And uh, I mean, there's, there's many, you know, we, we all heard them. You've got all the feedback uh, through Mr. Mayor to Mr. Waters. Um, I don't want to repeat everything we've heard tonight, but we're all looking forward to understanding um, a clarity on uh, some of these issues. The reports are coming back. I appreciate the fact that the next meeting, whether it's a GC or another public planning, um, would be to resolve the majority of these uh, questions, concerns, have answers in the reports, full some reports that have all the details. Um, just wanted to mention right now um, is the, I know we're talking, I think the reason I'm thinking GC is, and I think we all understand that, that when it comes back, we either say yes or no. Why go around and around? This is the second time. Lots of passion and to have another meeting with the same type of feedback. Um, what I'm looking forward to is to have a GC with some solid answers, solid reports. The residents can align to the majority of issues, hopefully, and we can move forward with a uh, development that we can be um, we can be happy with. So, for me, uh, I mean, there's, I've got tons of notes here, but you've heard it all tonight, and uh, I know that you'll come back with some fulsome reports for all of us. Um, I think the, the that's it for me, too, Mr. Mayor. Just that uh, I think we just have to get to the bottom of everything when the reports come back. And uh, we're well, looking forward to hearing uh, from everyone then. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments or questions? First time? Second time? Councillor Gardner, second time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, our uh, public planning report says the purpose of this report is to update council on a revised application submitted and to address questions and comments from the first public planning meeting. Um, I have many years of experience with public planning meetings and I have never seen so many outstanding issues and concerns. And I think it's completely inappropriate to, was completely inappropriate to bring it to us with so many outstanding issues. I mean, how can we do our due diligence and make a responsible decision? And 
I would like to go back to a public planning meeting, but I can see that the will is not going to be there. Um, so as to what Councillor Humphreys has said, when it comes back to a public planning meeting, it will not be acceptable if these comments and questions and concerns are not answered. Again, I think it was disrespectful to bring it to us in this state. Um, yep, thanks to the residents, they were amazing. I can only imagine how many hours they spent on this. Um, the residents who were speaking about quality of life issues, um, we have a duty to protect our existing residents and those residents who are not here yet. Most, I won't say most, I received so many complaints from residents about traffic and noise and safety. And this is just setting itself up to be a, a long and complicated and very unpleasant process for the current residents and the ones coming in. And it's up to us to protect them. We, I mean, along St. John's, we put the homes way too close to the street. And now, and we didn't require enough trees to buffer. And now we have very unhappy residents. Um, so with respect to the, the, the horse shed and the barn swallows nest, um, I don't care what the excuse is. It was wrong. It was uh, it was destructive. And if somebody wants to ignore uh, protecting an endangered species, they should have to pay for that. the The words aren't enough. And I don't know if there's anything in our policy that can make that happen. But you just you just can't kill things because you want to tear down a building and, and use it for development. Um, I'm just going to do my wrap up speech. So we have a developer who's purchased uh, environmentally and ecologically sensitive land with lots and lots and lots of trees. Uh, they certainly knew what they were buying. Their job is to build a development that will provide the most profit. And our job as a council is to prove development that is good for the community, good for the land the development is going to sit on, um, that respects and protects our natural environment. And certainly in this day of climate change, um, we must listen to the residents. They're like the state of California. They're the bellwether. We can't imagine what's going to be happening with respect to climate. We, we've seen an example of that this summer, as was mentioned by the resident. We've seen catastrophes and they're just gonna keep coming and they're gonna be even more intense. It's time we put our money where our mouth is. How many environmental motions have passed this council? How many policies have got in place? Here is the time to show the residents that we're serious about this, that we care, we care about them and their quality of life. Um, I know this is going to go forward. I'm very sorry about that, but uh, we need for sure to have the concert, all of the conservation authorities concerns figured out when this comes to our GC. I have never seen the conservation authority have so many issues. With respect to the region, um, I mean, this, I don't know when this report was done, but it's the first time I've heard about the mapping. So, uh, I'd like to know why we didn't know about it before this planning meeting and if, in fact, uh, the region's comments that are in this report, if, in fact, they don't apply anymore. 
So through Mr. Mayor to Mr. Waters, the comments that we have here, uh, they're on page, I think 11. Mr. Waters and Councillor, I give you an extra minute. That's not true. They're on page 13. Are they, are they inaccurate? Are they untrue? Do we not have to pay attention to them because they're talking about the MCR has to be done before we make a decision on this property? Through Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Mayor. I've had discussions with the Commissioner of Planning at York Region um, uh, in terms of a process moving forward, uh, which may not be reflective of what uh, staff um, understand at this point. I'm not sure if he's communicated that with, uh, with his staff uh, as they drafted these comments. Councillor, I, I got you. I've given you an extra minute this time. Around. Well, well, just to repeat, Mr. Mayor, when this comes back to his GC, um, we need an answer to this one. This is a big one. Absolutely. Councillor Gilliland, second time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Gardner, for bringing up the uh, barn swallow um, incident. And definitely there is some clarity that's been made tonight, some admissions to some things that were missing from the report. Um, I do want to thank the residents for doing all their hard work in um, the research and the reports. And it's really tough for us to, as council, to sit here and make these uh, decisions and opinions without these reports. So it's, it's extremely important extremely important to have these reports in front of us. And I am very disappointed that we're at this time where we don't have that in front of us to at least make an assessment or an informed opinion. So I appreciate all the effort the residents have uh, done in order to question Mr. Gibbons and uh, all the other consultants that are here tonight. I, I certainly don't want to be repeating everything that's been said, but I agree with everything that's been said. Um, but I do want to see what these reports have to say in the eye. I'm going to be looking at those like single conservation authority points because it's a long list. And, and we got to pay attention. So we're going to hold that to account. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Humphrey, second time. Uh, thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just, to, just a quick note, not to repeat Pettit again, but that's you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Waters. Um, there was lots of concern about traffic as well. So We'll hopefully get some more clarity on impact. I know there's an impact assessment, but I, there's just a lot of concern about that and being a two lane road versus four lanes between Young and Bathurst and all the impact there. So, really hoping to get a, a little more information when that comes back. And just a question to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Waters um, are, you, are you confident that you'll be ready at a GC for all these reports and answers, or would you prefer in your staff another public planning? I know this is something I think uh, is a recommendation in staff report to go to GC, but hearing what you heard tonight, I just want to make sure com you know, staff feels comfortable because I'm really going to be looking for lots of these solid answers and I don't want to put the staff under uh, undue pressure, you know, that another public planning up to you. I'd Mr. like to hear from staff. Mr. Waters? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what we have before us is basically a concept um, of how the land could potentially develop in terms of the lotting pattern, the blocks, um, the natural heritage system. We understand that there are a number of issues outstanding that we still have to resolve that could affect, you know, the final layout of, layout of the plan, either at the draft plan stage or subsequent to that. But I think it's important at this point, we don't have all the answers and I acknowledge that, but I think we need to sort of say, this is the plan for us. Um, do we generally, you know, are we okay with this concept moving forward to the next step where we can get you the answers that you're looking for and that have been raised by the public? Council? Okay, sounds like you're really ready for a GC. Um, just, uh, just, and I didn't want to bring it up, but it's been mentioned, you know, the tear down of the, um, the horse um, shed. It's a little disappointing. Just those types of things aren't good and the impact of that. So, just we need to, needs to be the developer needs to be working with us closely follow the rules and be a good neighbor this is as mentioned going to be a massive impact to our um, residents and uh, however we need to move forward in the right manner is important thanks thank you council for reason just i think mr waters is going to get that clarity and some information on I that, appreciate for, that not only for us but also for mr Sul Suliakis. perfect thank you thank you 
Councillor Gallo, second that. Thank you. Um, just to, to clarify my understanding on, on the York region, um, uh, clearly there's some discussion that, that took place because what I heard you say is very different than what's in the report. And I'm just going to read it just as a contrast because you understand our frustration from this side, not knowing what you know and what you said in the microphone tonight. I want to read it. A portion of the lands subject to the proposed OPA are located within the, the area currently identified as rural area on map eight of the York Region official plan. York Region's pre-construction comments indicate that bringing these lands into urban area can only occur after completion of the York Region Comprehensive Review. York Region also indicated that receiving an application prior to the completion of the MCR process would be considered premature and not in conformity with the current regional official plan. You'll get that. Someone reading that, it's pretty clear language what the region is saying. I heard something different tonight that they're saying, well, maybe there's a clerical area or, or there was a mistake made. You know, would have been nice to have had that in the report because it, it eases, you know, us to say, okay, the region is dealing with this. It's not as you know, significant as what's written in their comments, um, but I don't have that. And you'll understand the frustration that sitting here, hearing something different than what I read, it just, it, it, it throws up all kinds of flags and puts question into so much more. We just got to get these right as much as we can. There's so much more. I'm going to leave it till I, I assume uh, uh, um, a, uh, the next meeting, um, which is recommending a, a general committee. Mr. Mayor, through you, I'd like to make a proposal that, that I think would help us codify at least what we're all feeling we want at the next GC. So the recommendation, the first one is basically to receive. The second one, I'd like to add a small point to that. And it says uh, that the comments provided at the public planning meeting, I'd like to add uh, and comments from the various departments and agencies be addressed by planning and, and development services in a report to a future general committee meeting. So that we codify that we're not interested in a long list of reports that will be dealt with later on by staff. We want to see them in a GC the next round. Uh, so that, I'd like to put that forward and, and uh, I hope for your support. Second. Councillor Humphreys. Any comments or questions to that amendment? What's that? I can't hear you. Sure. Mr. Clerk, can we get that put on the screen, please, before we vote? On the amendment? On moving the amendment? Yep, what's the question? Go ahead. I'm sure it's appropriate that I move this amendment, and I know Councillor Gilland also had her hand up. You, you didn't move it. I, I oh, said I didn't, Councilor, I didn't I second said it? Councilor Gallo moves it, and it's seconded by Councilor Humphreys, I said. Okay. Okay. Councilor Gallo, you want to speak to the amendment? Pardon? Mr. Clerk, do you have it, or do you need to repeat it? No, you got it? He's good. Well, let's let's see when it goes up, Councilor Gallo. If it's if it's exactly as you said, then then we'll we'll continue with the vote. If not, then we'll get some clarification on it. I don't think that's exactly what you said, but go ahead. Can we get Councilor Gallo's mic on? Go ahead, Councilor. Um, well, what I said was and comments from the various departments and agencies. Okay, so comments from various departments and agencies. Staff comments, public comments, and not a long list. And then, and then I would just remove that and after that, and it just be be addressed. Hmm? 
I can't hear you. Public planning, oh, so can we get just a, a plural on the meetings? Public planning meetings? Councilor Gallo, we're good? Good. Councilor Humphreys, good? Call the vote. Pardon? We'll, we'll take care of that. I think we all have an understanding of what that, that means. So I'm going to call the vote on that amendment. Use your iPads, please. Councilor, see up at the top, does it say cast vote or it says no? Yeah. I do need to do that because the clerk's been bugging me and I haven't done it. Okay, while we're waiting for, well, now we're in the middle of a motion. I can't do another motion. We'll have to wait for a second. Can I just ask Councillor Gilliland to say it? And Samantha, could you plug it in? Is, yeah, Councillor Gilliland? Yes? That carries. Okay, so back to the main motion. Before we continue, can I get a motion to extend? Councillor Humphreys, Councillor Thompson. Can we 11.15? All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Back to the main motion. Councillor Gallo, you still have the floor? You're done? That's good, okay. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. I just I just wanted to add briefly that you know I've always seen public planning as the opportunity for the residents to provide their input, uh, you know, raise their concerns, and, and hopefully get their their questions answered. And I, and I recognize that some of those questions, you know, uh, still are unanswered and or necessarily the the answers aren't satisfactory to the residents. But um, you know, the concerns we heard raised tonight to me are, are along the same lines as we heard the first time with regards to the buffers and the environmental concerns. Uh, certainly the tree removal, wildlife, uh, traffic, the north-south road that cuts through Newmarket and Aurora, you know, and again, I mean, all of these things need to be addressed and considered, but at this point in time, you know, we do have a responsibility under the Public Planning Act to make a decision. I think we all agree, you know, appreciate the uh, the work and the efforts that the residents have, have put into this uh, application and the information they've provided us and their thoughts and opinions on the matter. Um, and look forward to getting those additional reports so we can make that well-informed decision. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily see any value in going back to another public planning meeting because I think the concerns are still going to be there. The onus now is getting those uh, concerns or those questions answered and addressed, which Mr. Waters is uh, committed to at a future GC meeting. And then it's council's decision whether or not they want to move forward with this or not. And I think that needs to be done and so that's why i was in favor of moving to the next stage but i would agree with the comments around the table that we need that information and we need to see uh be it the agency's comments the residents concerns or the questions raised by members of council either answered satisfactorily or uh, understand why not thank you councillor of everybody twice except for councillor thompson um Council, did you want to put that motion forward to speak again? Council Gardner? Pardon? Did you want to put that 
motion to waive procedure to allow you to speak again. You're good? Okay. Council, before I call the vote, I, I mean, I agree. I think that, um, first of all, uh, thanks to the residents for coming out. Public planning is always um, a long night, but we're very thankful to each and every one of them for coming out and, and, and speaking to us and speaking directly to us and putting out their concerns and doing all the work that they've done to to uh, you know raise the questions that they have. I think it's, uh, it's very helpful with us. I mean, we... I always say that if you, you want to get into and become an elected official and, and be and get on council, you need to get ready to read a lot. There's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of information that gets thrown at us, and we do a lot of work as far as going through all these uh, these applications. But there is a lot of information that we need, um, and I think that, um, as was mentioned, I think that we need to continue to move the process forward. That is, this is the process, and so we're not making a decision tonight. And I think that's important for everyone to understand and even for the public to understand. We're not making a decision tonight. We're moving forward in the process to make sure that we continue to all work together as we uh, come to a point that where we can make a decision as a council. And that's where we will get to. Uh, if we don't have all the information that we need to make that proper decision for our community, well, then we won't make it. And we'll say, and we'll say no. If we do have the information and we feel comfortable and we feel it's the best in the best interest of our community as a whole in this town, well, then we'll move forward with that decision. Um, so I, I just feel that it's important for everyone to understand that there is no decision being made tonight other than to continue through the process of planning. And once we get to that GC, hopefully we have all the questions answered that we need to make an informed decision in the best interest of our community. With that, I will call the vote. Councilor Gardner? Pardon? Oh, did you? Did you get it? Oh, I got it. I'm getting a head shaking now. Still not? No? Councilor Gardner, did you just want to just say your vote and we'll get them to put it in? Your vote is no? Okay, thank you. It's a no for Councilor Gardner. No, that carries 5-1. Confirming bylaw. Someone would like to move that. Councilor Humphreys, Councilor Gallo. Use your tabulators or your iPad, sorry. Councilor Gartner is absent. You still having problems, Count? Do you want to just say it, Councilor? Councilor Gillan is a yes. It's been a while, everyone. I think we're gonna have to clean up our our, our iPads and how we how we're doing this one and get used back to it. I I don't worry about it. It's our first one using them, so it's okay. That passes. That carries. Motion to adjourn. This one, we don't need the iPads. Councillor Gallo, Councillor Thompson, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.